We're ready, Chair Kenny. Thank you, Dina. And good morning, Your Worship. And I've got echo here, so I'll stand back a little bit. Am I okay now? I'm guessing. Okay, good morning, Your Worship. Good morning, Deputy Mayor Bray. Good morning, fellow councillors. Good morning, staff. Good morning, the whole town of Wasega Beach, and especially the people that had the time to visit us this morning. Good morning. It's my pleasure to call to order the Wasaga Beach Coordinated Committee for Thursday, July 21st, 2022. At this time, I don't see any disclosure of preliminary interest. Um, however, uh, during this time, fellow councillors, if you do discover that you have it, please notify the chair of the day. Uh, now we'll enter into the community service section of this meeting. Deputations, presentations, petitions, and public meetings. And we do have a presentation. Actually, we have two presentations and deputation. And the first one, uh, I welcome Mr. Ken Voss. And he's here in regards to the Wasaga Society for the Arts. Ken, please. Uh, Your Worship, Deputy Mayor Bray, Councillors, staff, guests, uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present for a few minutes this morning and update on what the Wasega Society for the Arts has been up to. Last time I did one of these was in front of uh, Hazel McCallion and the Mississauga Council, but you seem like a friendlier lot, so this is good. The Wasega Society for the Arts has been uh, been around for you know a few years now, and we are attempting to uh, define ourselves and what we're going to what we're going to do for a living, and I'm here to update you on what's happened in the last few years. So this is our mission statement. Advance the public appreciation of the arts, encouraging, supporting, facilitating, and promoting developmental initiatives and activities of the artistic communities of Wasega Beach and Southern Georgian Bay. By Southern Georgian Bay, we include ourselves in Clearview. Um, we had a look around at what other uh, municipalities are doing in the area. Midland, for example, has a cultural center that was, is pretty fantastic. We had a fellow by the name of Fred Hacker come and do a presentation on how that came to be. Uh, they, have a, they have a physical facility. They have the tenants, the Huronia Players, which is a theater group, the Quest Art School, uh, the Rotary Hall for Community Event Space, which is a permanent space for uh, community events, obviously. And we thought, you know, what could we do with a facility like that? And then we looked at Collingwood. They've got a pretty active arts community as well. Then we looked even at Meaford. I don't know whether you haven't been to the Meaford Hall, but it's a pretty fantastic, it used to be the town hall, it's a pretty fantastic facility with a theater and an art space, an art gallery space that they rent out for functions to, to raise funds. Um, so we thought, you know what? We're better than all those places. What could we have to promote the arts here in Wasaga Beach? Who are we? We're a not-for-profit organization. Been around since 2015. We have just achieved a Canadian registered charity status, which is, uh, I think, going to be a benefit to us and to the community. We have about 68 members right now signed up. And by members, I mean artists. These are uh, people from the community and the surrounding community who want to be able to interface with one another want to be able to make connections, help events, and they are very, very active. It's a volunteer-driven organization. We have an eight-person uh, board of directors, one of which is myself, and even our curators at the uh, art gallery, they're all volunteers. We operate on a shoestring budget, we shall say. I guess the art gallery is probably our most uh, visible uh, uh, function in the in the in in our um, there we go in our town, but it's not all we do. We don't just support uh, painters and sculptors, which are kind of the primary uh, people that occupy the art gallery, but we support all of the people you see here: poets, novelists, people who make movies, documentaries, photographers, even animators. Uh, obviously, the visual, drawing, painting, sculpting, graphic design, um, stuff that you see in the art gallery is, is you know, f foremost of mine right now. 
Well, we also have cooking classes, believe it or not. The art gallery is a lot more than just a display space. It's over, for those of you that haven't been there, um, it's, it's occupied uh, a second floor um, facility over in Stonebridge. We have held art therapy classes there where we bring people in who are having mental issues, difficulties, and we can use art to help them feel better about life. We are organizing a fine arts education camp later in, this, uh, later in August for 9 to 16 year old people. It's going to be held there. We we're going to bring in artists of, of, from our, obviously from our members to help kids learn about art. And what are the advantages of art? And why would, how can you get good at it? We provide free office space for, for groups like the Blues Festival folks that are using our space now to get organized. So there's a lot of stuff that we do. Here's what we do. We're a connection point for local artists and events. So as we mentioned, the Blues uh, folks are with us right now, and that, with the links that we have to the local arts community, they have contacts that they haven't had before. So we become a connection point. We're a conduit for participation in the arts, and we are a support for this town, for this council, in anything you want to do in the artistic community. We drive the creative economy year-round. What that means is we want us to be, we're already on the map obviously, but we want us to be enhance our position on the map as a destination for artists and people who are interested in the arts. Bring tourists to this town year-round. Events, we have art exhibitions, fine art classes. We have a woodwind group that comes and practices in our facility. We, there are a number of groups actually that come and play music in our facility and do their practices and rehearsals. Uh, We're getting involved in, a, uh, in an in indigenous display uh, to coincide with the Truth and Reconciliation Day on September the 30th, and I know the town's involved in that, and we've been involved with some of the staff in town to see what we can do to help support that initiative. I was interested to see that uh, Councillor Kinney is, uh, I wrote this one down, the chair of the community services section of the coordinated committee. That's a heck of a title. Uh, looking at what we can do to advance arts in the high school when it eventually shows up in our community. What can we do to help? And why do we want to wait for the high school? What can we do to help right now in our primary schools to advance the arts to students? We want to do that kind of stuff. Maybe we can do something in the library. We have upcoming events, lots of them. There's a, a new uh, show about to start called Exuberant Expression. We have the Collingwood Artist Education people coming over to use our facility and, and do some more education in arts. I know they're from Collingwood, but I'm not about poaching people from our surrounding towns to promote Wasaga Beach Arts. We have a business after five event, uh, September the 29th at the Art Gallery. We're at the Farmer's Market. As I uh, Previously mentioned, we're trying to uh, help with the, I think it's called the Caitlin Monson uh, for Arts and Culture Conference, which is a proposal for the town in uh, September. All that to say, the message I want to leave the council with is we are here to support your initiatives in any way we can. We have a group of active, excited volunteers and artists that are at your disposal. So just give us a call, and we're here to help. Thank you for the opportunity to present this morning. Appreciate it. Are there any questions? Thank you, Ken. That was, um, I'll save my comments to the end as usual. Uh, I see Council Foster, Council Blanche, Deputy Mayor uh, Bray in that order, please. Thank you for the presentation. 
thank you for the presentation. I just want to, um, again, I've, I am a friend of Steve Wallace, who's been very involved in that, and so I've, I've kept up to date on it. But there's a comment here, or a point, about driving the creative economy, and I just want to bring up for Council's uh, uh, information, I suppose. I went to, uh, as many know, I was in Mexico for a while this year, in a town called San Miguel de Allende, which in the 1920s decided to develop an art and culture um, center, and it's now a mecca for art and culture that's known by artists the world round, uh, around the world. So you sit there and say, to create uh, the economy, an artistic economy, you sit there and say, it is, it is in, it's all around the world, there are, are, are hubs, and so if, if we could work towards becoming a hub for art, because for those of us who are photographers, there's that big water beside us that's stunning at night. And uh, anyway, I just thank you for the presentation. And, and I, I think perhaps, in my opinion, you understated the, the, uh, the creative economy and what it can do for, for a town. So those are my comments. Thank you very much. Well, it is working now. OK. Um, Thank you very much uh, for the presentation, Ken. And uh, I want to go back a little while. Um, quite some time ago, we had uh, had a significant meeting where we asked about 450 people in attendance what was uh, most important to them and what they would like more of in our community. And the number one answer was arts and culture. And uh, I've always uh, sort of had a view of uh, Wasega Beach being a little like Stratford, who has a huge uh, arts and uh, community, and and that we'd only be a little more beachy, you know, which would be good. And uh, I would uh, I would like to see council consider in the future uh, that not just that you support us, uh, but that we support you. Uh, you know, I think that given that we do not have <coughs> Uh, strong manufacturing or industry within our community, uh, the arts is a huge opportunity. Uh, we have more recently made uh, more investment into public art, and I, and I think that should be a budgeted item that we actually up front decide how much a year that, that we would allocate to public art. I'd also like to see what we did with the library some time ago is to create a specific reserve to start saving for a cultural center. And uh, so those are things that uh, maybe in the near future or uh, that uh, council could consider. But uh, arts and culture is a huge synergy with tourism and we can become a Mecca. And, uh, and it would also work to beautify our community. And I, I think that's a, a needed element. So thank you again. Thank you, uh, Ken. Good presentation. I think the Wasaga Society for the Arts has come a long way. Um, having been involved at the very beginning and then taking a step back to let others uh, jump in and, and lead the way, it's exciting that you've got your CRA. I know in your fundraising, it makes a big, uh, big difference when you can offer a tax receipt. So looking forward to seeing new and exciting things. I think your gallery is exciting. Um, it certainly gives people something to come and visit. And the arts community, there is a bit of a buzz going on. I know I have a young artist working with me, and uh, certainly, as Councillor Belanger referred to, uh, the town investing in arts, whether it's murals at the skate, skate park or painting a building, um, you know, whether it's Collingwood putting out the RFP or Wasaga Beach, there really is a buzz. People are talking, and it's exciting to see the, the town getting behind the arts. So thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, and Councillor Watson, please. Uh, thank you, Chair Kinney. Um, thank you, Ken, for the presentation. Um, I'm really hoping our new uh, arena library complex is going to help out with uh, some of the aspects of the Wasaga Society for the Arts. I know the, the one uh, ice surface is going to have seating for about 900 people, I think, in there. So that should. Um, you know, allow concerts, um, exhibitions, um, trade shows, that sort of thing, art exhibits, to um, to be in that facility. 
there, so I'm looking forward to that. And the new library is going to have uh, community rooms and meeting rooms in it also. Uh, and I'm hoping that we can display uh, local artists uh, within that facility. And I think recently, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think we had authorized the CAO to speak with the school board about um, looking about partnering, about uh, a, an art center or something like that, is that correct? Yeah, I think because we, we've talked about partnering before, the school board likes that, and I don't know if the CAO wants to talk about that, but I think that was an initiative that we're working on now to uh, when, when the high school comes to, uh, to work in that regard. So thanks again. Thank you, uh, Councillor Watts and um, uh, Mr. Van Van Gore. Thank you, Chair Kinney. Yes, I can confirm that uh, we have reached out to the school board uh, and expressed the town's interest uh, in working with the school board on the development of a uh, artistic program, community use in the new high school. Um, the uh, planner that I spoke with was very appreciative of the municipality reaching out, indicated that the timing was good um, and that uh, once the high school site is secured and uh, the uh, planning starts for the new high school, which will be in the, in the next uh, year or so, that um, the time will be right to uh, formalize those discussions. I've also reached out to the Wasaga Society for the Arts to let them know about this, uh, this opportunity. And there are, the, there are other artistic groups in the community that uh, uh, will be engaged in this uh, discussion as well. So. Um, the seeds have been sown, and uh, it's now time to uh, wait for a bit and then uh, get that conversation uh, going in earnest. Um, one thing, if I may, Mr. Chair, just to comment, and, and I think the Deputy Mayor mentioned this, the fact that the Wasaga Society for the Arts has their charitable designation is significant in terms of the potential for fundraising for the uh, aspects of the of this new center, where, wherever it is, if it's a new high school, that uh, neither the school board or the town may be in a position to pay for, and so those types of those types of opportunities for charitable donations uh, go a long way. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, George, for that insight. And uh, if there's oh, I'm sorry, Your Worship, go ahead, please. Thank you, and thank you, Ken, for your presentation. Um, I think. George has spoken to um, our opportunities with the new uh, secondary school, but I think it's great that we have a group of local experts now. Um, I'm certainly not uh, artistic in uh, the, the normal ways, but um, I think it's great that we do have a resource now that we can go to when we are working with the school board uh, to get your feedback. So I think that that's going to be a really important piece um, to that. So thank you. Thank you, Worship. And if there's nobody else, I'll throw my two cents in. Um, Ken, uh, again, a great presentation, and um, I feel that it's one of the missing pieces in a whole town to have an art center. We need some culture in that. Um, you mentioned about getting into schools. You might want to touch base with our, um, our youth center. That might get some kind of an inroad and possibly, because we do have a facility there, I'm just thinking for oh, possible displays and or uh, a teaching opportunity. Uh, once again, I thank you. And seeing nothing else, um, I'll take this opportunity to um, read a motion. That the Community Services Section and Coordinated Committee receive the update from Mr. Voss on the status of the and plans of the Wasaga Society for the Arts for information. May I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Foster and second Councillor Boulanger. All in favor? That passes <clears throat> zero, uh, seven to zero unanimously. Uh, thank you, Ken. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate the opportunity. Now, once again, it's my pleasure to uh, as and I'm going to mess up some names here, so I apologize. Um, I have on my notes here Mr. Carrier and a Ms. Mazota, and I have a feeling chatting with the gentleman that that's not Mr. Carrier, Mr. Shackey. Please, please come forward. Uh, and uh, and I, and I welcome.
welcome you again. Um, and it's in regards to the Sheke, uh, Wasega Beach cruise, um, and a request for no walk or wake zone on the Nottawasaga River. Uh, and I turn it over to you for your deputation, please. First time. <laughs> Good morning, all. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Chair, uh, Council, Committee, Staff. Yes, my name is Guy Patrick Charrier. Sorry, Amanda Mazota. And we're here to request a no wake zone on Natsawaga River because uh, safety issue, water safety issue. So we're located at 72 Main Street. Uh, this is our boat. Uh, our boats are equipped with 12 seats so we can carry 12 passengers at a time for each boat. Uh, uh, our cruise activities. Yeah. Oh. Yes, so uh, we have noticed we're starting to bring a lot of tourism into the beach. Uh, people from all over. We're getting a lot of, actually from the Kitchener-Waterloo region seems to be quite popular. Um, but we've had visitors from as far north as like Timmins, North Bay, where, um, yeah, we're excited. We're slowly building our business and um, it's, it's quite fun. Um, so when our guests come, they have a tendency for booking accommodations and they're spending their money here uh, to and restaurant and bar, uh, they do many more activities as well. Yeah. Uh, most likely we have a big group of eight to 12 passengers come in for celebrating a bachelorette, by example. So they have accommodation and everything. They stay for the whole weekend. This is look like to be on their boat. People enjoy it, they see the view of the beach and they really appreciate the fact that they can see another way to see Wazaga Beach from the water. It's something unique and different that we have brought into the beach. Um, yeah, we've been trying to support our local community. We have been offering, and please spread the word, uh, free advertising on our boats for local Wasaga Beach businesses. Um, we're offering discounts for local residents. Um, we try to promote as much as possible local uh, all the local products, such as was Beach you. Brewery, Tonberry uh, Cider. All the uh, alcohol on boats is all provided by locals, most yeah. likely. So try to support locals. Um, the waterway issue. Obviously, the speed limit. I know uh, Councillor Belanger requested a couple of years ago to reduce that to 20. Uh, we don't even think in our zone 20 kilometers will make any difference because uh, the problem is uh, people don't respect the speed limit whatsoever. Uh, by example, uh, during uh, Canada Day, around 10 o'clock after the fireworks, a speedboat came, passed underneath the bridge as fast as probably 70 to 80 kilometers an hour just to spread water over the bridge to pe make people wet. So this is the kind of things happen. Uh, we noticed stunt driving on the river as well. Boat came around the river just on that zone where we are and they, they just make donuts behind our boats for no reason. There's no need of this, especially when you have two zone of 50 coming on each way. Um, we noticed many times people jumping from the bridge. It's three times at least Saturday, last Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, so our concern is when people jump from the bridge, they do it in the middle of the afternoon when boats and sea dews are speeding by. It makes my heart jump up into my throat every single time because as much as we may say no, like don't do that. We yell at them. We yell at them to not jump <laughs> it, but it makes my heart jump up into my throat every single time because I'm worried that a boat's gonna come by, they're not gonna see these kids in the water. I have actually called OPP in previous because of this situation. Like, well, as a previous medic in the military, safety is a huge concern for me. Um, I get scared. I'm not gonna flat out. I get scared. Uh, a 
October, or sorry, October, June 30th, um, the wakes were so bad that we had a boat traveling by just over by Nancy Island, and the wakes were so bad, somebody got thrown overboard, and they couldn't bring the person back on board because the wakes were so bad, and sea dews were just speeding past, like... Nobody, it, slow, nobody slowed down. Nobody, nobody slowed stopped. Down. Nobody tried to slow down. It was just, it was a free-for-all. And it makes me very uncomfortable. Mm. I get very nervous about it. We never realized how big a, an issue it was until we have been in this situation. Yeah. And I think it's more people just don't realize that this is a normal occurrence. Um, they think it's a one-off. They think... Oh, it just happened that one time, but it doesn't. It's every weekend. We're watching it happen. and Also, the high wake created danger for a passenger to jump in the boat. So we try to do boarding people on. We have to wait that all the boats pass. On Saturday, Sunday, quasi impossible. We have to do a briefing on the shore before they can go on the boat because it's moving so much. It's, it's impossible. So people uh, are just... Uh, on balance all the time and we feel like there's a danger for them We're one of the only communities that doesn't have a no-wake zone in a high traffic area and we're just asking to to follow what other communities are doing and Put in a little bit more uh, safety restrictions to ensure because it is such a high traffic area We have 20 CDs going out on an hourly basis across the river, yeah. another five to seven sea dews on our side. It's a very high traffic area. Also, uh, this waterways issue create damage on boats uh, because of the high wakes. Uh, yes. Also, because of the experienced pleasure craft operator, the people come here to rent a sea dew, the only thing they request is driving license. I've seen many people going to on a sea dew. That person doesn't even control that sea dew. So it's, it's always a danger for everybody. And when you have a boat speeding at 50 passing them, uh, we're looking for an issue at some point. Somebody will get injured. Uh, there's also ignorance of the laws and waterways. Uh, we saw many times people coming like inverse traffic. Like we own the boat, we're coming on the, on the right way of the traffic for the water, let's say like an highway, right? And the boat's coming in front of us because it wants to pass another boat faster. Like it's just very dangerous. And <clears throat> sad to say that, but there's a lack of supervision. Having one boat from the marine police on the water, it's not enough. When they park before Nancy Island, guess what happened after they passed Nancy Island? They know there's only one. So they keep going and they speed up and they, they don't care. Um, one of the things that, I don't know if that's gonna work. Can we click on the video? We'll see if it works. That's stun driving happening. Uh, like people with the sea do uh, just coming around her boat and just. And she's back. We've been doing this the whole day. <laughs> so come play around her boat, pretty. spin around. She's doing this the whole time. And she's across the river. On the wrong side of the river, again. She'll be back. We just do this all day. And the eyewake danger we can show you now. It's the next video. It's you're gonna see how the boats react. It's, this is Sunday when only one boat passes. The Imagine effect after the way you can pass. see like what's happening right now. The boats are bouncing, nobody's business. They almost hit the wall. And so the rope is putting out very uh, strength, the like seriously, to all this. This is why a no-wake zone is required in that zone. Plus, the danger and all the boats across there has been damaged just because they're bouncing all over the place on the dock and the wall. Anyway, so this is what I want to share. And that was it. Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock. So imagine when it's busy Saturday at lunch. Our big concern is also the people boarding. When the boat's bouncing that much, it's very dangerous to go in and out. Very, very dangerous. Anyway, thank you. Then 
one of the things that happened because of the wake, like you can see the cleats is installed to attach your boat. It just snapped on a Saturday. So we have to attach the boat by one of the railing just for a couple of hours until we change the cleats. So you can see the damage is made. That's on our boat, but that's imagining other boats, right, around. Also, when <laughs> boat pass, so we have to deal with this constantly. Multiple times a day. So if a boat pass really fast at 50 and create wakes, a boat's bouncing so much, then the drink's coming out of the fridge. So that's been reorganizing the fridge before the next cruise. Other than that, like, it's a mess. <laughs> Plus, now we're imagining, like, you're supposed to serve a pop that's just bounced all over the place like this. That's not a really good guest services. Our, safe, our concern is safety, 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 obviously. Um, I like this quote, an incident is just a tip of the iceberg. A sign is much larger problem below on the surface. Our request is a no-wake zone. The no wake zone that we'd like to request is just before the NC Island uh, and after the bridge at Main Street. So if we can get a no wake zone, it will provide a lot of uh, uh, facility for all the business around there and uh, also the boat launch. So the no wake zone will provide safety for all. So Wazaga Rave Runners is there across the street, uh, across the river, and uh, moving 26, 30 sea to at an hour. Uh, Playboy Sea-Doo is a new company just beside us, and they have like five, six Sea-Doo right now. Same. Uh, the marina across, um, owned by the Rutan family, their boat has been damaged. I talked to them. Uh, obviously us, Shakabazaga. And it will create also a safety for uh, everybody who, bunch, uh, who uh, boat their, launch their boat at uh, just beside yes. Nancy Island on the, on the ground there. And also all the visitors, but also many other boaters from the river. The Noah Exome will protect also Nancy Island uh, Museum Ground. Uh, we pass there every day, we can see the damage that could create uh, the bouncing water over the walls and everything. And we hope our decision will be about keeping people safe, uh, as it is a primary concern. We don't want any incident or worse, an accident happen. Before you make that decision, I will suggest uh, the council, mayor, please come have a look on a Saturday afternoon, just from a location, and see uh, what happened there. See how crazy it is. <laughs> <laughs> crazy is the word. It's a, it's a free for all. Yeah. It, it truly is. On behalf of Shaka Wazaga. Yes, Amanda Mazota. And Guy Patrick Charrier, thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shaka and Ms. Mazilta. Um, again, I apologize. Uh, at this time, I'm going to open up to council for some dialogue. Uh, Your Worship, and then Councillor Foster, followed by Councillor Boulanger. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I know over the years I've definitely uh, received calls about speed and stunt driving, and those are sent to the OPP. Uh, from a town's perspective, I believe we have signs up saying don't jump. Um, people are going to do that anyways. Uh, we've also spoken to local CDU operators to express the importance of educating um, those who are coming to the community, never been on a CDU before, and, and educating them on what they need to be um, doing when they're out there. Um, but it's always good to bring it here and uh, make it uh, more known to people. Um, I, my question to the chair is the motion that we have before us would be to go back to staff, but I I think it should Believe. say to River Resources. Um, your, your Worship, that is correct. Uh, I've got a note that has changed that around, okay. so it goes to the right place. Perfect. Thank you. Council uh, Foster, please. Thank you, and thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I, <laughs> I spend a good time, or a lot of time, up on the river further up and I I get that I know we've talked uh, uh, previously about you know speed limits and and the difference between boats planing and plowing 
Um, a no-wake zone is not plowing. A no-wake zone is much slower than that. Um, again, having also sat on the board of the, the Friends of Nancy Island, I, I support the, the thing in principle. I, I really do. Um, I think you bring up a good point with the, the bridge, and I think theoretically we should probably look at both bridges. Uh, that's where people jump off, not so much on the bridge at uh, McDonald's but, or Schooner, Schooner Town Park. Sorry, I can't plug a business. Uh, not so much there, but I do think it's something that certainly needs the consideration on it. And, and again, the, to me, the biggest challenge, of course, and you brought it up, is enforcement. Uh, we have enough trouble enforcing speed limits on the roads, let alone on the river. So this isn't just a simple fix. We can throw up signs, but again, putting up a sign and not having enforcement is just another pretty sign, and, and that doesn't fix anything. So if we do take it back, we have to find a, a solution that will not only put up a sign, but will encourage actually people adhering to it. So I look forward to uh, it coming back to the table. Thank you. Councilor Belanger, please. Thank you, Councilor Kenny. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, yes, uh, some time ago, I had brought uh, forth a motion to lower the speed limit on the, the river, but I, I think your suggestion of creating a no-wake zone in that divine, uh, defined space, it, it's, it negates the argument that if someone is living upriver and is a boater and it uh, would take them far too long to get to the bay, this is really just a safety precaution for a short period of time. Uh, I think uh, it would also allow for uh, some of the tour companies that had concerns about uh, capsizing kayaks and that type of thing. They also could operate in that area. Uh, I personally believe it's a good compromise. I believe that, uh, you know, we expose ourselves to liability, uh, especially when uh, on more than one occasion r residents and businesses are coming forward warning us of the possibility. So I think this deserves uh, serious consideration. Um, so I fully support it going back to staff and coming to council at uh, the earliest convenience. I don't think we've been down this road. I think it needs to be quickly where we still got, uh, you know, eight weeks of peak season. And uh, I would like to see a decision made quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Blanchet. And Councilor Watson, please. Thank you, Councilor Kinney. Um, we, we've dealt with this over the decades. Um, every five, six years, we get a requests about lowering the speed uh, on the river, no wake zones, and so forth. Um, I, I do agree with, with your presentation and trying to go somewhere with it, but at the end of the day, I don't believe the municipality has any jurisdiction over, over the river is what it comes down to. I'm not sure if it was Mr. Lalonde did a long report when the, the request was made to go down to 20 kilometers per hour. It's a very convoluted process going through Department of Fisheries and Oceans uh, and so forth and so on. So it's, uh, I'll be um, happy to hear what the River Resources Committee comes back with us at, but it's uh, basically speaking, it, it's, it's federal, provincial powers that really regulate the river and, and the enforcement from the OPP, which is again provincial to do that. Um, how you fix people jumping, which is not a good idea, but it's uh, people do stupid things sometimes. So thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Watson. Oh, I'm sorry. I go ahead, um, Councillor Belanger. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Kenny. Just uh, uh, one more comment is that you know no wake zones exist all over the province. It is uh, it's not something that is not doable, and uh, and I believe the municipality can certainly play a role in that. There, seems to be some confusion because I've been told both sides of the story that it's a municipal responsibility, that it's a, a you know, a provincial, that it's a, whatever the Ministry of Seas. But the other point I wanted to make, this also gives us a very specific area for enforcement. And, and enforcement could occur uh, not just by water. Uh, the area that you're suggesting uh, could be done by radar from the bridge. 
so i think i think it's reasonable and uh again uh, i i'm supportive of doing something thank you thank you um council blanger uh seeing anything i'll put my two cents in now oh i'm sorry go ahead please no no don't sorry you're go sorry, ahead please. uh just to reiterate um if this is something that's coming up every five to six years, I really think that this is a serious enough issue that needs to be further investigated to help to try and promote the safety of our community. Um, because clearly it's not just us that have noticed these um, actions and that this is something that has been a concern in the past and will continue to be a concern moving forward if this is something that has been I don't think, and I don't think that that's going to slow down as well because we have more people coming up. We have how many permits for new houses? People will have CEDUs. I mean, that's yes. not going to stop. There's going to be more and more and more all the time. So, Sorry. I think that's something we need to uh, address. address. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the added information. That's great. Uh, now, um, I'm just going to make a couple of quick comments. Um, great presentation. I totally understand where you're coming from with regards to safety. To Council Belanger's comment about doing raid on bridges, no, the OPP never do that. Um, that wouldn't be good. No, it's, it's an easy fix from that point of view. Um, all all um, organizations do have resource issues. That's probably the reason why you're not seeing more um, marine units on, on the river. However, um, again, from Council Belanger's comment about a reduced area, it would make it less hard to enforce from that point of view. Um, and with that, um, I thank you again. I'm going to read a, um, uh, a motion at this time that the Community Service Section and Coordinating Committee receive the deputation from Mr. Sheke and Ms. Rezota uh, pertaining to the request for a no wake zone on the Nottawasaga River from Nancy Island and finishing after the Main Street Bridge for information. And further that, the request be referred back to the River Resource Committee for review and report to a future meeting. Uh, could I have a mover and a seconder for that, please? Uh, Her Worship and Councillor um, Wells. Uh, all in favor? Thank you. That passes unanimously, uh, zero to seven. And again, I thank the two of you for taking your time out of your day. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor, Chair, Committee, to having us and let us uh, express yourself. Sorry. Um, yes, thank you, yeah. uh, Councillor Kinney. Uh, just one ca comment. Our, uh, our chief is in the audience, and he's head of uh, health and safety for our community, so I'm I would uh, like him to participate uh, with the River Resource Committee in the review. I think that would be appropriate. Thank you for your comment, and thank you again for your presentation. Now, it's my pleasure again to um, welcome another individual for a presentation. Uh, Mr. Ron Spina uh, will be in attendance uh, to give an update on the town Wasaga Beach Twin Pad Arena and New Library, please. Uh, thank you uh, through the chair. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm assuming everybody can see me clearly, chair. Okay, I'm uh, just going to uh, pull up, uh, share my screen for a, a brief presentation to give you an update um, on the project. Uh, back through the chair, can everybody see this slide? Yes, we can. Thank you. So I have a very brief uh, slide presentation for, for the committee, and I'm available to answer any questions. Um, and I will start off with where we are in the schedule. So we started construction in September of 21. 
Uh, everybody can see the, the, the structural steel frame going up. We had a slight delay in the, in the steel delivery. Um, the purpose for the delay, of course, was some of the uh, uh, market challenges that uh, everybody is aware of. However, when the steel did arrive on site, uh, we've been making very, very good progress on the steel. As I said, everybody, as they drive by the site, uh, they can see that uh, we've erected, the, the steel's been erected um, on the uh, one ice rink as well as in the lobby, as well as at the same time, you can see the steel uh, frame for the library. And now the focus is to put the uh, steel frame um, on the, what we call the event arena, which is the arena, as somebody mentioned earlier, with approximately 900 seats. Uh, progress is pretty good. Uh, we did, uh, unfortunately, have a slight impact because of uh, labor strikes. Uh, and the labor strikes uh, resolved themselves over the month of May. Um, and that has a, that, that's impacted the progress slightly. We were uh, initially trying to achieve substantial performance um, in, uh, in June of uh, 2023. Um, and this has added about a month to the schedule at this point. Uh, we're continuing to work with the contractor to see if there's a way to make up the time. But at this point in time, um, um, we're projecting a July 20 uh, substantial performance date. Uh, that would allow um, a, a few months for staff to train on the different systems in the building, significantly train, of course, on the ice plant, um, as well as to move in furniture um, and become familiar with the facility. So we're currently looking at uh, ready for use um, in the fall of 2023. Um, if you'd like, uh, through the chair, I can stop here for questions or I could continue on till the end. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Um, I think we will continue on, please. Okay. Okay, so I'll go to the next slide. So the next slide it just is starting to give you an idea of, of the progress. As I said, I'm, I'm assuming everybody here is probably driving by the site quite often. Um, so I'll just very, be very brief. Um, they're putting in uh, heating lines for the bleachers because the bleachers are going to be heated. We're going to recover heat from the ice plant, which is a very um, energy efficient way to deal with the to deal with the heat and re and reclaim it. Uh, the structure for the running track, um, as you can see on the slide on the picture to the right, <laughs> excuse me, is uh, is has been uh, place and they're continue to work in that ice rink. The next slide will just show you that there's also there's multiple trades on the site right now. It's not just structural steel and masonry. Um, duct work is also going going up at the same time um, on the left. So the, the mechanical trade is there working away. We also have the electrical trade working on the site. Um, as you'll see, there's a there's there's a lot of masonry work because this building is is essentially a, a masonry building, not only masonry on the outside of the building, but in the ice rink. All the walls in the ice rink are going to be masonry, and the reason being is that they're very durable and will last for a long time. Slide on the right shows some of the uh, the steel frame uh, for the library. And I'm assuming that uh, if you drove by the site today, you're, it's going to look different because these slides are approximately one to one and a half weeks old. And the next, the next slide it just shows you what I mentioned earlier that uh, there's block work is ongoing. Um, and so far, the weather has generally been pretty positive for construction. And we're hoping that, that we're going to continue to have this good weather so that we can continue to make the progress that we've made so far. The construction is approximately 40% complete at this point. 
I'd like to talk briefly about the construction contingency. So we do have within the uh, budget um, an allocation for construction contingency, which is for any any change work that arises during the construction. Um, typically, at the at the at the front end or at the start of the project, when um, a significant amount of the activity is reviewing shop drawings to coordinate shop drawings with design and address any other issues that, that may arise. Um, we use a construction contingency um, to pay for um, change work. Um, currently, we're continuing to reconcile the change work um, and we're currently tracking to uh, finish the project within the current uh, allocation for construction contingency. Um, so we're currently tracking um, according to uh, our financial plan. The next slide is basically it's a brief summary of the budget and what's been committed, which means what's been contracted and what's left to spend. So um, we the budget is fifty two million nine hundred and thirty six thousand six hundred and forty one dollars to be precise. We've committed approximately, well, we've committed 49,306,297, $49, and we have uh, approximately $3.6 million left to spend. Uh, most of that will be spent on what we call fixtures, furniture, and equipment, which is, uh, uh, you know, loose furnishings, um, uh, any of the equipment for the ice. Um, any of the equipment, loose equipment for the library, for the lobby, and for outdoors. Um, and we're, and there's some money, of course, left over for construction contingency um, for any other future changes. Um, once again, we, we're, we're tracking on target um, regarding fixtures, furniture, and equipment. <laughs> Excuse me, we hope to start uh, uh, procuring that um, uh, in the fall, at least uh, putting orders in in the fall of uh, this year. We spent a significant amount of time working with the Saga staff and Colliers and, the, and MJMA Architects to put together a work plan um, to move that forward. So um, those activities are, are still um, going to be significant um, from now until uh, the facility is open. Out ahead. So out ahead, as I already mentioned, significant amount of masonry work continues, continues and will continue for, for a while. Um, the ice plant, um, we'll, we'll need to install the ice plant, run it. Um, it's a Simcoe ice plant who pretty well have delivered almost every ice plant in Ontario. Um, and so uh, it's going to be a Simcoe installation. There's going to be training for staff on the ice plant. Continuing on with mechanical electrical systems. Um, we'll, once the library is enclosed, we'll start installing the library systems, um, the digital systems, um, any other special uh, provisions for the various equipment for the different rooms. I already mentioned fixtures, furniture, and equipment. Um, as well, we're finalizing uh, signage. Um, we're going through designs of the uh, uh, pylon sign out on the, the street. And uh, we're hoping that we can uh, get that all organized so that that's going to be ready, of course, when the building is uh, open, ready for use in the fall. So um, back to the chair. Chair, I've, I've finished my presentation. I'm available. Uh, for any uh, questions. Thank you, Ron. I'm looking towards council. If there's any questions at this time, I'm not seeing any. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Councilor Foster, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, I just looking at this. I just uh, on your first date, you're talking about uh, construction commenced on September 20th, 2021. And, and then you go into the budget. But I'm going, the budget was developed prior to September 2021, correct? 
That's correct. Okay. And really there's been no significant changes to the original proposal, I believe, that was posted. It's been posted on the town website previously, correct? Uh, if you, if, if back to the chair, if you mean no, no significant changes to the actual design of the building, is that what you mean? No, I'm talking to the budget, really. The oh, bu no, the, bu the budget hasn't changed. Okay, so, so in full transparency, the, that 50, whatever, $52 million has been there right from the beginning, and we seem to be pretty well on track to, to hit that, according to what I'm reading here. Is that correct? That that's correct. Okay, I just I'm just concerned because I've I've seen numbers thrown around of 60 million and 65 million, but it seems to me we put it on we created a budget a responsible budget and even with some changes for pricing of steel and some labor issues we still seem to be on t target for that. So I just would like to commend obviously staff who created the budget, council who approved it, and certainly our consultants who seem to be able to and construction who are able to deliver it. Uh, hopefully. Maybe not exactly on the timeline we wanted, but a month or two isn't the end of the world. And certainly within the budget we, we presented. So I wanted just to thank people for that. I think it's important to understand the transparency behind it. Thank you. Councilor Belanger, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Councilor Kenny. Just, just a point of clarification. Uh, the, the budget, I believe, was $59 million and change. That the $52 million is not including consulting fees. So when we say different numbers are throwing around, I think we're still on track for the $59 million budget. Is that not correct? Can I go back through the chair and know the 52 budget that I'm showing you includes all consultant fees. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Blanche. Um Any other questions? Not seeing any, oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> sorry, uh, Mr. Benamobkur. I tend to overlish you sometimes. Uh, no worries, Mr. Chair. Just with respect to the, the budget, the slide that uh, our project manager showed did not include land costs. So there are other costs that bring the total budget to uh, $59 million, almost $60 million. So that, that budget, uh, we're working with that. And later in the, um, in the agenda is a report from the um, Control the steering group that uh, outlines uh, the particulars with respect to the expenditure. But to your point, uh, Councillor Foster, um, yes, the project is tracking on budget. Thank you, George. And now really not seeing anybody. Ron, I want to thank you again for taking your time and updating Council on this very important project. And you have a great day. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Yeah, I was, thank you, uh, Councillor Wells, I was getting to that. Um, that the Community Service Section of Coordinating Committee received the, up, uh, the update from Mr. Spanini uh, pertaining to Wasega Beach Twin Pad Arena and Library for information. May I have a mover and a seconder, please? Uh, Councillor Watson and Councillor Wells. All in favor? That moves unanimously seven to zero. Thank you. Um, we have no unfinished business. Uh, other agency reports. I move right now down to our fire chief uh, for his reports, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning, your worship, members of council. It's good to be back in person. Won't forget to turn off my mute button. Um, so the month of uh, June um, was, again, our busiest month. We surpassed all the uh, call volume uh, numbers for the previous uh, month. So we were 188 calls uh, for service. Um, there was one structure fire noted in the, in the June uh, report, which was the, the, that new Mexican restaurant at the corner of uh, Main Street and River Avenue Crescent. I did speak to that at our last meeting. Uh, they have since made the repairs to their kitchen and I believe are up and operating, so that's good news. Um, with respect to other notable occurrences, we did respond to a very serious motor vehicle collision on June 23rd. Uh, this incident took place on County Road 7, which is 45th Street. Uh, the accident occurred, or the collision occurred between Morgan Road and Wasaga Sands Drive, which is actually 
um, on, the, on the west side of the road was a, a clear view fire um, department call. However, we responded and, um, and dealt with, we, we let them know we dealt with the, with the call. Clearview did not have to respond. Um, this was a single vehicle rollover. There were two occupants inside. Um, the passenger was able to get out and had absolutely no injuries. Unfortunately, the driver was trapped in the vehicle. Um, we had to remove the roof and the door to get the person out. The injuries were serious enough that we had to land the orange uh, air ambulance on the highway and uh, transport that person to to a Toronto hospital. So uh, I have not heard an update on the condition of the patient. On July 3rd, we responded to a motorhome fire on 22nd Street. Um, the fire was clo in close proximity to some cottages as well as a fence, and uh, we were able to get that uh, that knocked down before it did any real damage to those exposures. On July 17th, we had an electrical fire due to an air conditioning unit plugged into an extension cord and then a power bar. Um, this was in a, in a motel unit. Um, so the draw, the electrical draw um, from an air conditioner is, uh, is such that you can't be plugging it into temporary wiring. Um, it creates heat and it did um, it did actually catch the power bar on fire. Um, in this motel room, the smoke alarms were not operational, so a fine was, uh, was issued there. Um, station two renovations were underway finally after a long, long time. Um, they have demoed um, the living quarter office area. It's, it's uh, been stripped right down. They're, they're getting ready to start doing the rough in for plumbing, electrical, mechanical, and framing in, uh, in the rooms there. So, so that's underway. And weather warnings. Um, I did send something out to our emergency control group yesterday when we were getting the tornado warnings. Um, the rest of, I mean, we're so well informed now by the media, maybe sometimes a little too much because there were people that were very panicky about what, uh, what they were calling for yesterday. But uh, anyway, it's something we, we always keep an eye on. Um, and in heat related um, weather days too or something else we look at. Um, we do have the longest freshwater cooling center in the world. So I always point people to that when they ask if we have something in place we always have something in place. So, and finally, the wild wildland fire danger is currently at moderate in Wasaga Beach. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chief. A great report as usual. And Councillor Foster, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the report, Chief. I, I do want to uh, just when you talked about the cooling centers, the water is obviously one. But do we have the ability so people in an extreme heat? People can attend the um, Recplex uh, Town Hall. Like, is there a cooling center program? Not formally. I think the library, am I wrong in saying you guys? I'm not wrong. I like when I'm not wrong. So the library does uh, provide um, uh, space for people to, to cool off. Uh, we. In, in previous, going back a number of years, I know we, we did try opening a cooling center at the RecPlex to find nobody attending. So um, we haven't done it since that I'm aware of. And Chris is here, so I, I don't recall anything in the recent few years doing that. So. My, I guess my, my theory is that uh, although we do have that, some people are terrified of water or True. unable to get to it. So I do think it's something that we should, any town facility should, if you put out, if there is a, a heat warning or a advisory put out and you guys, it sh it sh we should have the ability to open town facilities to that. I just, I don't, we may have to develop a policy, but I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Foster. Uh, Deputy Mayor Bright, please. Yeah, and further to that, I know opening facilities would require staffing and, and supervision, but we do have the Seniors Active Living Centre, we do have the Youth Centre, um, the library, so we do have public facilities that are opened and are air-conditioned. So if you're taking your kids skating, you can sit in the air-conditioned lobby and watch them. Um, yeah, so there are alternatives if people are desperate. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, 
and not seeing any more comments, I'll make my quick two ones. It's great to see that station two is moving forward for the guys and the gals. Um, and again, um, Chief, great report. And thanks to you and your staff. Thank you. Uh, now I'll read the, rep the motion. Resolve that Resolve that the Community Service Section and Coordinated Committee received the June 2022 Fire Department Report for information. Uh, mover and a seconder, please. Uh, Deputy Mayor Gray, uh, Councillor Watson. All in favor, please. Thank you, that moves seven to zero unanimously. Uh, now we move into the consent agenda. Uh, at this time, I have four um, items pulled. Uh, Council Belange, I just want to confirm. Uh, 3.5.1, 3.5.4, and 3.5.6. Thank you. And Her Worship, 3.5.3. Uh, Thank you. Uh, those will be pulled, so I'll read the agenda. Resolve that your community service section coordinating committee hereby receive the July 21st, 2022 consent agenda items 3.1 through 3.6, and that all recommended uh, recommendations contained therein be adopted, including excluding uh, agendas. Uh, items pulled from the motion and voted on separately, and we've already named those. Uh, could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Foster and Deputy Mayor Bray. All in favor? Thank you. That passes seven to zero unanimously. Uh, we're going to move into uh, 3.5.1. One CAO Chair Construction Steering Group Report Update. Uh, Council Blanger, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councilor Kenny. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, in, in reviewing the report, uh, there's some clarification that, that I would like. Uh, one of the indications was that town uh, consultants are reviewing a request from a trade for a price increase due to a substantial increase in material costs that uh, are required. And I, I think it may have referred to the costs uh, at a later date, but I, I don't believe it was in this report. And it wasn't indicated the material involved, but, but more importantly, um, I just wanted clarification on, uh, and, and it'll come up a couple of times today, is when we have a fixed cost contract, uh, it sort of was my understanding is that if something changes, that that's the, the contractor or the builder's responsibility. And uh, so this goes on to, uh, well, maybe I'll just leave it there and, and if the CAO could reply and then I'll go on to my other comments. Thank you, uh, Council Belanger. Go ahead, George. Thank you. Through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, that's correct. This is a stipulated price contract or a fixed price contract. Within the terms of the contract, there are specific clauses dealing with requests for price increases. So um, any contractor is, uh, does have the right to submit a request for a price increase. It doesn't mean that the price increase gets approved. It has to be reviewed and reviewed in the context of the provisions in the contract. So that's where we are now. We're reviewing the, the request. Um, our consultants are reviewing it. We have the, uh, the contract provisions that we're relying on and we'll uh, get a recommendation from our consultants and we'll, we'll deal with it at that time. Thank you. I'll just uh, go on. The report indicates that there's been 42 change orders approved at a value of uh, 750000 and three that are still under review, representing uh, a quarter million dollars in that we have half of our contingency utilized. Uh, but would there be any point where, uh, I know we have delegated authority to uh, go ahead with the change orders, but will council receive a, a list of change orders 
what was changed and the amounts involved, whether it be a plus or a minus, because I, I would request that. Um, and finally, uh, it listed seven cash allowances estimated at 125,000. And uh, I didn't, I'm not sure what the difference is between a, a change order and a cash allowance. And maybe you could give us one example of a cash allowance just so that uh, I could understand that. Um, and, and again, whether or not council would uh, get a listing of those cash allowances for review. And then I have one more comment after you reply to that. Thank you. Through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. So the uh, construction steering group, or the CSG, has a list of change orders. And so every two weeks, we review the list. The list has been compiled. It's uh, there. Any new change orders are brought uh, to the CSG for, uh, for review. Um, council has delegated authority to the CSG with respect to overs oversight of this particular project. It would be up to council if they wanted to see the list of change orders or not. The CSG certainly does that review. Uh, so that's dealing with that aspect. With respect to a cash allowance, and um, uh, Chris Roos, our Director of uh, Recreation Events and Facilities, is here, but a an example of a cash allowance would be the pylon sign um, at River Road uh, West. So that's that sign is a cash allowance item. So it's something that the town will be paying for, but the, um, the contractor is looking after through the consultant in terms of sourcing and, and whatnot. And I'll look to Chris, did I get that right? Was that uh, this, the pylon sign a cash allowance? Yes, it is. I got it right, like the chief, thank you. Thank you, that did help. And, and then just my last comment was, is that it, you know, it's exciting that we're remaining on budget. And I just had a question. At this point in time, uh, is, I'm not sure of the total fundraising that has been done, but at this point in time, is the uh, uh, intent that all of the fundraising would pay down the long-term uh, loan or debenture that, uh, that was originally budgeted for? Thank you. Through you, uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. With respect to the fundraising, the um, the goal is 1.7. We're at 1.5 million uh, pledged um, at this point. I don't believe, and I stand to be corrected. Uh, perhaps the director could correct me, but I don't believe the the fundraising has been allocated uh, within the within the budget. So there are options with respect to uh, what to do with those uh, fundraising proceeds. Thank you. Thank you, and that's all I have for this one. Thank you, Councilor Blanche. Um, any other questions at this time? Not seeing any, I will read the motion. Uh, 3.5.1, that the community service section of coordinating committee receive the Twin Pad Arena and Library Project Construction Update for Information. A mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Foster and Her Worship. All in favor? Thank you. That passes 7-0 to zero unanimously. Now we move down to 3.5.3, customer service coordinators report dated July 3rd, or July 21, 2022. Uh, that would be yours, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just looking to have this referred back to staff. In the past, we have asked that um, when our fees go out, they come back to uh, committee in a, like this way. This? Okay, thank you. Um, they come. We ask that they come back in a certain format so that we have all the information we need prior to making a decision. And this report did not include um, other candidates or other prices. And, and when I looked uh, into it a little bit closer, um, this recommendation is actually for the most expensive um, submission. So I just really feel that we should have all the information like we get in other um, staff reports when we have an RFP, so I'm looking to have it referred back to staff so that we can have a fulsome report before us before making a decision. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Bray, please. Uh, thank you, and uh, 
good comments from the mayor. I agree there should be a standard rep uh, report when RFPs come back to council because it's nice just to be able to compare apples to apples to apples when we're looking at the purchase of different products for the town. Um, what I wanted to add was it's very important as you get talking to the community that we continue to publish uh, paper copy. So there are a number of people that I've been speaking to in recent weeks um, that do not have access to the internet. They don't have um, printers, they don't have, they may or may not have a phone, it might be a flip phone. So our senior community definitely relies on printed materials and I think um, the one I was speaking to most recently said, you know, they get their, their information from the newspaper. So if it rains and their paper gets wet one week, they, they see nothing of the town information because they're not on social media. So thank you for continuing to print the, uh, the guide. I think it's really important for our community. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Council Foster, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I just uh, might refer to the clerk on this. The, um, the mayor requested a referral back to staff. I don't think that's a debatable item. It should, the vote should be taken right away to refer it back to staff. And I'm happy to, if the mayor wants to move it, I'll second it. That's correct, through the chair. That's correct. So uh, you can vote on that motion to refer back to staff for more information. Yes. Um, do I just moved wordsmith by, it? It's moved by uh, Mayor Bifolci, okay. seconded by Councillor Foster, that the report be referred back to staff for further information. Thank you. Um, moved by Her Worship Foster that the motion be moved back to staff for further information and at this time if I'm correct I need um, all in favor thank you that passes seven to zero uh, unanimously now to the clerk that deals with three point five point three yes you may go on to the next item in your agenda thank you Next item is 3.5.4, Director of Recreation Events and Facilities Report dated the 21st of 2022. That would be Councilor Belanger, please. Thank you, Councilor Kenny. Um, first, I, uh, and, and, and I don't want, uh, there's sort of two sides to this, but uh, first of all, I want to really congratulate uh, our events team for the Canada Day programming. I, I spent a good part of the day at Beach One and it was excellent and, uh, and certainly drew uh, a very large crowd. There was a crowd at the beach, but there was a, a very large crowd in the area of the entertainment and again, very outstanding. Uh, but I did want to uh, bring up some things uh, about, uh, about Canada Day. Uh, and and I, I think it's important because I've, I've brought some of these up on numerous occasions over the years. And uh, some of what I'm going to talk about, I experienced firsthand. I heard comments from tourist guests. And uh, I really believe we need to take some action. The first was uh, our washrooms at the main beach were horrific. Uh, we, we really need to dedicate, uh, especially on the peak season during uh, big events, uh, there probably needs to be a staff member going back and forth between the two washrooms. They were, uh, frankly, upsetting uh, at the time I saw them, and, and I'm sure they're being cleaned at points in the day, but these are, these are being used at an extremely high volume. Uh, there was also uh, a lot of instances of overflowing uh, garbage receptacles. Uh, and I believe it's probably more costly to have to pick that all up off the ground as opposed to uh, emptying those receptacles on a more regular basis during those uh, peak times. The, the other thing, uh, and I, I did uh, talk to staff uh, by law, it, uh, it was indicated that it uh, wouldn't fall under their responsibility, 
uh, but I did ask that it get passed along. But I, uh, again, this weekend, I experienced the same thing. But right now, with the turnaround at Spruce Street, uh, the available parking fills up pretty quickly. But a lot of people that visit our community, they, they don't even necessarily know. They're still expecting that they can do the loop of Beach Drive or whatever. Uh, but the, the traffic was getting caught in there. And the pedestrian traffic on Main Street and the uh, car traffic, vehicle traffic on Main Street in both directions was that if you went in and realized there's no parking left and wanted to come out, you could, you could have been 40 minutes. Uh, fortunately, uh, the day it happened to me personally, uh, an OPP officer, after about 20 minutes, uh, drove down the boardwalk, saw the situation, went up to Main Street, parked his bike so no traffic could enter Spruce Street, and then signaled traffic to allow traffic to flow out of Spruce Street. Uh, again, this weekend, we ran into the same thing. So it really is something that needs to be monitored and we need to look at either a light or an officer uh, that could direct traffic in those situations because people were also becoming quite irate and, and doing some things that uh, were, were not very good, like as trying to get, get a maneuver and get ahead of other people uh, to get out. And then the final uh, comment I had, and um, you know, hopefully it's, uh, it's an easy fix, is uh, we program the stage with music, uh, but on occasion uh, it came to my attention that the, the chairs for guests to sit on were under a chain and lock. And uh, I think whenever we have a programmed event that the chairs should be available uh, for our guests to use. So uh, hopefully there's some opportunities there. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Belanger. Any more um, questions on this? Uh, I have one note, though, and I thank um, Councilor Belanger for bringing it up with regards to that officer on a bike. Um, I'm hoping, and I mean this in the nicest way, that you had the opportunity to put in a good word at the detachment, because we've heard before resources on the river and stuff like that. I know it's hard to get officers on the bike, and that would go farther for that. Thank you. Um, not see Oh, sorry, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Looking at the uh, the report here, there's 10 pages of of activities and events in the community. We're a very busy community, and I commend all staff for bringing these events and, and coordinating them and uh, assisting with them to provide entertainment to uh, both our residents and our tourists. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Um, seeing none other questions, I'll read the motion that the Community Services Section of Coordinated Committee does hereby receive the Recreation, Events, and Facility Monthly Act Report for information. A mover and a seconder, please. Uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Bray and Councillor Watson. All in favor? Thank you, that passes unanimously zero to seven. Uh, moving now down to 3.5.6, Director of Building and Development Services, Chief Building Officers Report. Uh, Council Belanger, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Councilor Kenny. Uh, yes, on 3.5.6, under discussion, section thir third paragraph, it indicates that climate change adaptation and mitigation has emerged as a cornerstone of the code and go uh, goes on to uh, reference specific sections of the code. And I think it's important uh, to recognize that uh, currently, uh, it's uh, my understanding in the report, that our library arena build is coming in at 30% uh, better than <coughs> the standard of the code. So that that is very positive news. Um, 
but it's it's also true that the the code uh, does not uh, mandate uh, solar power and uh, and I believe that uh, there was a decision at some point that there was some special insulation related to the floor of the library that was removed from the contract. I don't know if that had much of a bearing on this, but what was interesting is uh, recently, uh, uh, is this the one? Yeah, so. Oh, those two items. Uh, I've been told are approximately three million dollars. So if we were to add solar power and uh, possibly some additional insulation, that that would have been a cost of roughly three million dollars. Uh, and and I don't know how close that would have taken us to a net zero uh, emissions build. But it was just interesting recently that North Bay's, uh, who are building their uh, community center received $26 million in federal funding, and it was indicated that the primary uh, reason that that funding was granted was that their build was a net zero greenhouse gas admission plan. Doesn't mean they would necessarily hit it right on, but their plan was a net zero build. So, uh, I just uh, thought that was important information to share. Thank you. Thank you, Council Blanchet. Um, Deputy Mayor Bright, please. Thank you. I just wanted to point out that um, the decision to put solar panels on the roof at the build stage was not made because there was additional cost, as you pointed out, and meeting the budget was very important to the build of our new library and our, our Twin Fat Arena and library. Uh, but the roof that we're putting on, if I'm correct, is ready for solar panels. So when there's time, when there's funding, we can go ahead and do it. But at this point, it was more important for our community to stay within the budget than to you know, add more bells and whistles that we couldn't um, you know, be seen to be affording at this point in time. So I think meeting the budget was our number one criteria, but it's really important to notice or to note that the building is solar panel ready. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Councillor Blanche, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I certainly uh, recognize our appreciation for the budget, but with due respect, had a net zero plan resulted in $26 million in grant funding, I think that would have had a very positive impact on the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Blanche. Um, Councillor Foster, and then Her Worship. Thank you. Um, I was going to talk about the, the lead process because years ago uh, when we started to, I think, even build this build, this room we're in right now, I was pushing that all uh, town uh, properties had were lead um, certified. Uh, subsequent uh, or previous uh, building of, uh, heads of building have pointed out that lead is only one type of certification you can get and in this case we've meet, met or exceeded it without having to uh, go through that that process um, that was going to be my original comment then to just to councillor Belanger's last comment uh, it's pretty assumptive to assume that having net zero would have resulted in a direct 26 million dollar uh, grant to the town that's that's not the I'm quite sure that's not the only um, criteria that uh, was done when the when the government gave North Bay was at 26 million dollars uh, it might have been a factor but I, I don't think that you can just say if we had done that we would have received 26 million dollars in grants I don't think that's an accurate uh, portrayal thank you thank you Councillor Foster her worship please Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just on that same note, um, I'm concerned that we throw these numbers out there and the public then thinks that um, we've lost out on something. I've heard that several times about um, not building on Main Street and that we lost out on all this grant money. There was absolutely no grant money um, allotted or promised to our community if it was located on Main Street, so I don't want there to be any misunderstanding that um, had we done this different or spent an extra three million dollars that we would have got 26 million or, or any money so each application that goes to the government is looked on at its own merit uh, the community as well we have found in the past that Wasaga Beach is extremely responsible in how we spend money and sometimes we don't gr get grant money because of that 
Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Councillor Watson, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the report, Danny. I think it's uh, very, very informative, and it does show that we've uh, put a lot of thought into this building to, uh, to meet uh, the emerging, um, well, not the emerging, the climate crisis that is upon us, and, and, and the building is, is going to perform very well, and we have the ability to do some enhancements, like we talked about with uh, solar panels and, and so forth, and uh, uh, I do agree with, with the mayor's comments that uh, we're very successful in getting grants in the, in the community, and if it doesn't go to this project, it goes to other projects in the community. It's all money monies that come in to, to uh, help us uh, with their residents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Um, Deputy Mayor Bray again, please. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up. Councillor Belanger had referenced um, the City of North Bay. And doing a quick search, they're currently in the design stage of this project. So yes, they have received some funding. But I think if we all watch their tender when it actually goes out for construction, that it will be a heck of a lot higher than us for a much smaller facility. So I think if we're going to be throwing numbers out and comparing, we need to compare apples to apples. And, uh, and the North Bay one isn't necessarily a good example in this, uh, in this case. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Bray. Um, before I read the motion, I too want to compliment um, Danny and his team with regards to that report. It really enlightened me on some of the awesome stuff we're doing for our environment. Thank you so much. I'll read the motion now that the Community Services Section of Coordinated Committee receive the Director of Building and Development Services Chief Building Officer Report on the S Sustainability Measures and Energy Efficiency Design Considerations for the Twin Pad Library Facility. Um, a mover and a seconder, please. Her Worship and Councillor Watson, all in favor? That moves seven to zero unanimously. And now at this time, it will be my pleasure to turn the chair over to Councillor Watson for public works section. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kinney. Um, we are now in the public works section of coordinated committee. Uh, we have no deputations, presentations, petitions, or public meetings. We have uh, no unfinished business, and we do not have any other agency reports at this time. We we'll now move into the consent agenda, and at this point, I only see one that one item that has been pulled, which is 4.6.1 to deal with transit. Is there? Is that still the the case? Okay, so it is resolved that the uh, Public Works Section of Coordinated Committee hereby receives the July 21st, 2022 Consent Agenda Items 4.4 through to 4.6 and that all the recommendations contained therein be adopted, excluding agenda items pulled from the motion and voted on separately. May I have a mover and a seconder? Uh, Councillor Kinney is moving it. Councillor Blanche has seconded that. Um, those in favor? That is passed uh, seven to zero. Thank you. And we will now move to item 4.6.1 transit. Uh, Councillor Belanger. Thank you, uh, Chair Watson. Um, in item 4.6.1, there was some uh, pretty exciting news uh, in that the Wasaga Beach Transit. Uh, operation and maintenance of specialized and conventional transit contract report indicated that uh, we are now working on the final implementation details of specialized transit for our community. And uh, we've been uh, waiting some time for this. Uh, up until now, the Red Cross has uh, done that uh, responsibility within our community, but primarily just uh, for medical appointments. Uh, my understanding is the specially, uh, specialized transit will also help individuals with uh, mobility or health issues uh, uh, do other types of appoint, uh, appointments like grocery shopping and that type of thing. 
Uh, it's, it's not all great news as the uh, specialized transit buses, it indicates our uh, a supply problem at the moment and it may be up to two years uh, before we can secure bus, but uh, it also indicated that uh, Collingwood has agreed to share one of their buses with us and then we were going to use a conventional bus uh, where we could. And uh, so I'd ask uh, our Director of Public Works to maybe let, let me know who uh, that we can acknowledge and thank in Collingwood for that. Uh, but finally, if you, uh, if Kevin could also uh, just give us a, an indication of when he uh, feels we might be up and running. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Belanger. Yes, very exciting news that uh, we're, we're successful with the next phase of, of procurement here with, with Landmark Transportation Group, a, a great service provider, and we've had great relationships with them over the years, so we're, we're happy to see them uh, be the successful candidate as well. Um, yeah, you, you did note uh, within the report that specialized transit vehicles are in high demand supply chain issues and there is uh, an extended uh, delivery time on all transit vehicles, all vehicles period as, as you well know. Um, we do have a spare conventional bus which is fully accessible which we do have the, the opportunity to use. However, the town of Collingwood um, have also indicated that as they transition away from their contract with Red Cross, currently they supply uh, specialized transit vans to Red Cross to operate within the town of Collingwood. So they have transition plans to move away from Red Cross and then those vehicles will be free uh, for us to use over, hopefully over the next couple of months. Um, but in the meantime, collectively Clearview, Collingwood and ourselves are working towards uh, uh, policies for our uh, transit operator to follow in terms of specialized transit and, and uh, eligibility criteria. So, so we do have a bit of work to do before we roll that out. But uh, yeah, great news for the community. And, and uh, through the contract, we also have flexibility to introduce uh, you know, electric vehicles, electric transit buses as we explore uh, the electrification of our fleet in, in the coming years. Uh, we also have flexibility within the contract to uh, move towards on-demand transit and, and demand responsive transit. So um, getting away from the fixed route and, and having some flexibility with, uh, uh, within our community to those regions that don't currently have a fixed route bus. So uh, there's lots of opportunities within this contract for us and, and uh, it's exciting for sure. Thank you very much, that is exciting news. Deputy Mayor Bray. Uh, thank you. Very exciting to see this coming to our community. And just a reminder that while we're waiting for buses to be available through our own program, that Lynx Plus is a service that is available through the County of Simcoe that helps people get door-to-door um, -door service through the county buses. So. Any further questions, comments at this time? If not, I'll, I'll just make one. Uh, thank you for the report, Kevin. I, I've noticed uh, one municipality in the area has already decided on um, accelerating some of the, the programs of, of their municipality because of the supply chain problem. So things that might be two or three years down the road, they're actually putting in orders now so that they have these, these things at the time. So just mentioning it uh, to us as we go forward, maybe that's something Council could could consider uh, on there because I, who knows how long these issues are going to going to stay with the things and it's also happy to hear about the electrification options that we can look forward to going, uh, in, in the future. So thank you. So at this time, I will read the the motion for 4.6.1. Resolve that the Public Works Section of Coordinated Committee does hereby recommend to Council that the operation and maintenance of conventional transit. Part B.1 uh, and Joint Specialized Transit Services, JP.1 uh, for the Town of Wasaga Beach be awarded to Landmark Student Transportation in accordance with the Joint Request for Proposal, RFP number FIN 
2022-001P for the period of August the 1st, 2022 to July 31st, 2027, and further that the mayor and staff be authorized to execute all necessary and relevant agreements. May I have a mover for that, please? Councillor Kindy and seconded by Councillor Wells. Those in favor? Thank you very much. That carries seven to zero. That concludes the public works section. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be a short break or we're, yes, okay. So we will call for a short break. It's now almost quarter two. Is ten minutes enough? Five, five two. Okay, we will resume at five to eleven. Thank you.
And we're live, Chair Foster. Thank you very much, and welcome back, everybody, to the Development Service section <coughs> of Coordinating Committee. Before I get into it, I'll just remind anyone on Council, if at some point you feel you have a conflict of interest, please declare it at the time. Uh, right now, we have deputations, presentations, petitions, and public meetings. We have none. Under unfinished business, we have four items, one of which is on hold at the request of the applicant, and the other three are being worked on as we speak. No other agency reports. Moving us over to the consent agenda. I will note items 5.5.3 and 5.5.5 have been pulled. If there's none other, seeing none, that Development Service Section of Coordinated Committee hereby receives the July 21st, 2022 consent agenda items 5.4 through 5.5 and that all recommendations contained therein be adopted, excluding the agenda items pulled from the motion and voted on separately, as I just noted. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Watson, Councillor Kinney, all those in favor, please. That motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we'll go first to 5.5.3, the economic development matters. Councillor Belanger, you pulled that. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair Foster. Uh, yes, uh, I, again, there's some exciting news uh, going on in our town. Uh, I think most people are aware of our uh, Wasega sign that is uh, becoming quite iconic very quickly and uh, I'm glad it cleans up well uh, and, and it seems to be quite durable. I've uh, seen children climbing on it and uh, a number of things happen but it, it is a, a great addition and a great opportunity for photo ops and just seeing on um, you know social media and different sites uh, it, it's spreading uh, quite wide and, and <coughs> I think it was a very good investment. Uh, but more recently, I've uh, been seeing some wayfinding signage going up. It's also uh, very attractive and, uh, and very needed. And I was just wondering because I, I haven't obviously been around all of town, so I don't know if, if this phase or if everything's complete or if it's in process, uh, but certainly what I've seen so far is, uh, is uh, very welcome and a great addition to our town. So I didn't know if, if we could just get an update on where we are in the process. So uh, through you, Chair Foster, so the wayfinding strategy is broken up into five different phases. Uh, so the signs that were installed into the community this month uh, were part of that first phase. So the, this included 11 signs um, and they were installed in problem areas that were identified uh, with our consultants when we wrote the strategy. So they're really just around like Beach Area One and at a couple other areas throughout town. Then the second and third phase, uh, it will look at all other directional signage in the wayfinding strategy. And currently myself and Public Works are writing an RFP to install another 35 of those directional signs. Uh, so these signs will be at major intersections throughout the community. Uh, the fourth phase is trail directional signage and like town entrance signage. And then the fifth phase, is all other placemaking signage such as beach area identifi identification and park signage. And then, so to answer your question about timing on when the strategy would be fully executed, we don't have a deadline, um, like a specific deadline, uh, because allocation is determined, or sorry, because the amount of signs that we install every year are determined on like the allocation that we get through the budget. Um, but the goal is to have all recommended signage installed within the next five years. Uh, so ECDEV will be submitting another request through the 2023 budget as well. Thank you very much and uh, congratulations, looks great. Thank you. Does anyone else have a comment? No, Council Palacio, you'll move that. Okay, so I'll read this. The Development Service Section of Coordinating Committee receives the July Monthly Activities Report for information. Councillor Belanger is going to move it. Seconder, please. Councillor Kinney, 
All those in favor? That's carried unanimously. Thank you very much. The next section is 5.5.5, the Public Works Engineering Services, uh, George and Sand Subdivision. Uh, Councilor Blanche, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you again, Chair Foster. I, I always feel important when we have a number of residents expressing a concern that uh, we, we acknowledge their concerns. Um, after reading the report, I want to make it clear that uh, the understanding uh, that I got from that, that it appears that there is no documentation or record indicating uh, that ELM uh, would install the uh, chain link fencing that uh, is being petitioned for. Um, I, I, again, you know, we, we can't verify whether an employee uh, in a situation might have said something, but in any event, that can't be confirmed. And, and certainly the town is not in a position to demand or mandate uh, a developer to do that. It wasn't a part of the planning requirement. But with that said, there, there was a safety concern. There, there was standing water uh, with a fairly significant slope uh, that potentially could have been a hazard. Uh, in a, I guess in a ditch that was designed not to hold standing water, turned out to be a, a beaver's dam. But I think there's, there's no guarantee that an obstruction of ice or some other uh, blowing or falling material couldn't cause a problem. So the, the only thing I would re request is that in our conversations with Elm, who is a large developer that clearly would have the opportunity to get pricing for both fencing and installation uh, much cheaper than a, a personal individual, uh, and of course, uh, you know, has the potential to, to do the, all of the jobs at once if they could offer the residents possibly a, an attractive price. Uh, and again, I'm not suggesting that they have any onus to, to follow that suggestion, uh, but I'd like to see that uh, there could be some collaboration and that uh, resident safety concerns could be addressed and uh, without a huge cost to the, the developer. That's it, thank you. All right, thank you for your comments on that. Um, staff can discuss, thank you. Staff will discuss it with the uh, developer. But again, as you mentioned, there's no onus to do any of that. It's, uh, but again, a conversation never hurts. So if there's nothing else, seeing nothing else on that, I will then read the uh, resolution that Development Service Section of Coordinated Committee receives the Elm Georgian Sand Subdivision response to petition by homeowners on Sand Hill Crane Drive. Staff report dated July 21st, 2022 for information. I'll look for a mover and seconder, please. Councillor Belanger and Councillor Wells. And I'll ask all in favor. And that's carried unanimously. I believe that brings us to the end of development services. I just think I would be remiss if I did not point out yet again that uh, our development services team are extremely busy with uh, a number of uh, applications and proposals moving forward. And again, I think we're record setting again. This, yes, I get a nod. So again, we're setting new activity records in the town. So with that, I will turn it over to the deputy mayor for uh, uh, community services, I think. General Thank government. You. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Foster. Uh, so we move into the general government services section of coordinated committee. Today we have no deputations presentations. Uh, we have nothing under unfinished business, no other agency reports, and our consent agenda at this point has one item pulled, which is item 6.5. Seeing none, I will read the consent motion resolved that general government services section of coordinated committee hereby received the july 21st 2022 consent agenda item 6.4 through to 6.6 .6, and that the recommendations contained therein be adopted excluding agenda items pulled from the motion which will be voted on separately could i have a mover and a seconder please mayor by fulci uh, councillor wells all in favor that motion carries unanimously thank you uh, so the one item that was pulled was 6.5.1, the Manager of Human Resources and Chief Administrative 
officer's report uh, regarding a whistleblower policy. Councillor Belanger, you wish to speak to this? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Bray. I appreciate that. Um, yes, I, I have uh, quite a bit to, to comment here, and I'll, and I'll go through it, but I, I do want to acknowledge the fact that uh, 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 our HR manager had reached out to me. Uh, she uh, had discussed most of the points that I've raised here uh, and give me some rationale as to uh, the process that went through to come to the report before us. Uh, but there are uh, a number of uh, areas of the report uh, that do not uh, satisfy what I believe is a robust whistleblower policy. And um, so I'll just read. Uh, related to the whistleblower policy, uh, I will not be able to uh, support the report as written and are requesting the following amendments be added and voted on. That whistleblower complaints would be filed to an independent third party professional that specializes in these matters and they would determine whether an internal or external investigation process is required. That the timeline to report irresponsible, unethical, or illegal behavior or activity be extended from 10 days, which I believe is unreasonable, to three years. That the whistleblower policy also applies. Now, I, I will point out here that uh, our HR manager indicated that uh, that it is the case, but I, I want to be very clear on this, that the policy applies to members of council, to all businesses or corporations owned by the municipality, and former employees, both of the municipality and owned businesses. That any non-disclosure agreements would be deemed null and void if the complaint cited irresponsible, unethical, or illegal behavior. And I want to point out that there's a significant move in Canada to remove NDAs. There are already two provinces in Canada that uh, ha will no longer allow them. The, the last point, I, I will suggest that uh, although there uh, could be a clarification that would satisfy me, but 3.09 and 3.10 uh, are somewhat in conflict. Uh, uh, one indicates that the complaint of will not be, may be made aware of the specific disciplinary action taken against a complaint of, but 3.10 indicates uh, whether or not the complaint is satisfied with the outcome. So there may be a way uh, to satisfy a complainant without them knowing uh, the specifics, but I think I think that uh, given uh, given the complaint and the serious nature of uh, what it would be, uh, I think there should be some flexibility there. And uh, when these amendments get added to the vote, if the vote is unsuccessful, I would then uh, request that the motion be referred back to a third party specialist to be reviewed and make further recommendations. The policy as stated appears to be no more than a typical corporate complaint policy versus a robust whistleblower policy. An internal reporting process does not make sense to me given that a whistleblower policy by definition is to allow employees that fear speaking out internally to speak out through a third party independent process. After all, in a municipality, senior management work closely together, friendships can be established, and uh, a, an employee could be very uncomfortable to come forward. Uh, that's also why the timeline has to be longer. Uh, we haven't had the ability for employees to come forward to a third party independent process, uh, and I'm not suggesting there are any, uh, but it's a possibility. Whistleblower complaints should be rare and third party reporting is very reasonable in cost and acts as an insurance policy against the municipality's liabilities 
in this potential serious situations. I also want to remind uh, uh, Council that uh, in, talking, in reviewing the HR manager's comments, she indicated that she looked at what a lot of other municipalities were doing and, and our report was consistent with that. I want to remind Council that when we created our indemnity uh, policy, our indemnification policy, we were one of the first in Ontario, if not the first to do it. So this is about going beyond what's happening now. This is talking about creating a very robust whistleblower policy. And again, finally, a whistleblower policy of this nature may also act as a deterrent to uh, defer or to not have the need for some serious activity <coughs> or uh, breaches to occur. That, uh, so those are my comments. And uh, so uh, firstly, I would like uh, the report amended and voted on. And then secondly, uh, if, if that is voted down, that it uh, be referred back to staff. Thank you. So, Councillor Belanger, I think your amendments are a little too complex to be handled on the fly. Would you like to suggest we continue the discussion and then maybe refer it back to staff? Uh, I, would, I would be satisfied at this time uh, referring it back to staff. Uh, but I, you know, if Council deems that, uh, that that's too complex, uh, but I, I, I'm not prepared to support the current report, and I'm not uh, prepared for it to go forward without my amendments being voted on. So, are you making an amendment? I guess I wasn't yeah, clear. Is there I'm a second to ask the, to the clerk. I didn't hear an amendment. I heard uh, a speech. Certainly, Deputy Mayor. Um, so, if there are clear amendments to a motion that you would like to um, suggest then you could do that. If you would like to move a motion to refer, you could do that. Um, we would need a seconder for both, uh, or either or. So if you did a referral motion, then um, that takes precedence and it would go back to staff. I will go forward with uh, amendments to be voted on. And if we don't get a seconder, so be it. So do you want me to reread them? Yeah, that's sure. fine. Councillor Foster, did you want to jump in? Yeah, sorry, I do, but I, I just want to be clear on the amendments because there was part amendment and there was part. So just what the wording for the, the specific amendments, I'd like to hear that directly. Thank you. I will do that. Councillor Belanger, before you speak to your amendments, would is there anything that the HR manager would like to add to the conversation? Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the comments that have been brought forward. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, we, we did look at a number of municipalities, one being cited through a deputation that was cited as um, a very strong, that has a very strong policy, and that's the uh, city of Calgary. Uh, I did also review the this uh, proposed policy uh, with our human resources lawyer. So um, we, certainly endeavored to try to make it oh of course I'm sorry uh, should I start again or okay thank you so um, the uh, this this policy has been um, it has been made as comprehensive as policy trying to put in place the ability to utilize a third party um, in my 12 years of being here, we certainly have used a third party a number of times as far as uh, conducting investigations. Um, so, and the, uh, the scope, I hope uh, it, it is clear that it does cover council members, businesses, um, you know, former employees. It would cover any sort of complaint that's brought forward to the municipality as well. So hopefully that's a little helpful. Thank you. Uh, did, sorry, Councillor Foster? Sorry, I just want to, and again, I think I'm reading it here, but you said they do have 
external parties can and have been used related to those kind of uh, a, a whistleblower type issue. Correct. We have utilized uh, external. And, and this policy still allows that to exist. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, just for clarification, the complaint in the current policy has to be uh, filed internally, not externally. Through Chair Bray, yes, it, it does. So I'll read the amendments and uh, with the HR manager's uh, comments on record related to who, what people are covered, I'll, I'll leave out that amendment. The whistleblower complaints would be filed to an independent third party professional that specializes in these matters and they would determine whether an internal or external investigation process is required. That the timeline to report irresponsible, unethical or illegal behavior or activity be extended from 10 days to three years. Excuse me, excuse me, Joel. Should we not be dealing with each one independently? As no, I'm, you? I'm, no, because it's I'm, put each, yes. It's all or none? That's okay. correct. Okay, thank you. That any non-disclosure agreement would be deemed null or void if the complaint cited irresponsible, unethical, or illegal behavior. Seconder. You're looking, you're looking for a seconder for that amendment? Looking for a seconder for the three additional amendments to the motion. Councillor uh, Kinney, uh, all in favor? Uh, sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm just moving along. Is there any discussion on the motion as amended by Councillor Belanger's three additions? Mayor Thank Bifulci. You. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, to the amendment, um, the uh, manager of human resources has explained it with respect to the third party. Uh, the way the the, um, the policy is currently structured is that uh, sh she uh, would be the intake individual for any any complaints under this policy. And I just want to emphasize it's an employee code of conduct, so it covers uh, town employees. Um, so it, she is the intake, and then from there, as she's indicated, you know, in the past, if she feels it's appropriate, she has reached out to a, an external third party, and we have used external third party investigators. However, um, she also has the ability to be able to initiate an investigation on her own with respect to, uh, to that. So I just wanted to clarify that point. Um, with respect to the timeline, um, we, had an, uh, we had a discussion about that internally with respect to timeline uh, about filing a complaint. Um, the councillor has indicated uh, three years. Uh, from, from a staff perspective, we don't think that that's a, that's a reasonable time frame. We put in 10 days. We had a discussion whether it should be a month, three months, six months type thing. Um, what we wanted to avoid was we wanted to avoid any situation where there could be a vendetta or some sort of ulterior motive in filing a complaint. If there was an issue that occurred and an employee um, contractor became aware, um, obviously there is, that's a sensitive issue and it may take some time for the employee to determine is this something I want to do? And you know, it's not, it's a big step. So we wanted to give some time, uh, whether 10 days is appropriate or not, um, we're not sure, but we felt 10 days, if it was, if it was uh, and if something happened, the employee was concerned, mulled it over, um, then it would, within 10 days they could come and, and uh, make that complaint. As I said, we wrestled with it as the, the manager of HR, uh, in her research looking at other policies, there was no time frame in, in other policies. Um, but we, uh, we felt that there, that there should be, and that's why, it, why it's there. So um, I just wanted to point out those, those, uh, those comments. The other, the other thing is that we've had an employee, uh, we've had a whistleblower uh, policy within the municipality. We've had it in our uh, employee code of conduct. It's outlined in the, in the report. We've had it for a number of years. Uh, it is there. So this is an enhancement 
uh, of that of that policy. Um, again, we're trying to follow um, municipal best practice, and I think the policy is a is a, is a solid one. Um, you know, if if the members of council wanted to deal with the time frame, I think um, certainly staff would be open to that uh, that uh, discussion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, just following uh, Mr. CAO's comments there, it sounds like staff internally have reviewed this um, in depth. Um, you've discussed it amongst yourselves. You've got the um, legal involved with it as well, and I won't be supporting the um, amendments. I think um, you know e each and every one of us could pick this apart and, and not like one section and say we're not going to support it. Um, I think that's why we have staff, and I think that's why we have legal, and I will be supporting um, the report as is. Thank you. Councillor Foster. Thank you, Madam Chair. And again, uh, given that the amendment was all or nothing, I'm not going to be able to do that. But I do, because again, the third party, that it should go directly to a third party. This is a corporate um, policy, so the corporation should be aware of it right from the start. Our HR uh, manager is a professional in, in, and trained as a professional and has duties as a professional. So she can... And that's why I asked for the cl clarification if, if there are resources that can be accessed by our HR people to, to uh, if they feel it's, it's appropriate. So that section I wouldn't support. The timelines, I didn't know exactly why the three years was picked, but I do agree that perhaps uh, a longer time frame could be done. And if we refer it back to staff, which I think we should, um, it allows people time to... Uh, perhaps cool off after whatever incident it might have been to give um, time for them to reflect, perhaps to look for advice. So, you know, so something, I think something more along the lines to three to six months might be far more reasonable because, again, memories fade for everybody over time. So we want to, uh, three years, you know, I mean, I really don't remember what I had for breakfast. So three years would be uh, but, and I, I, sorry, I shouldn't say that because I'm not demeaning the issue of a whistleblower as, as that. So, so I do agree that timeline should be extended somewhat. And then the no uh, NDAs, um, again, uh, I think that's where our legal department, our legal advisors would have to come in because a non-disclosure agreement, if it's provided, uh, has, in my opinion, I'm not a lawyer, but has to be respected. Regardless, if, we, if they've signed a non-disclosure agreement, we can't all of a sudden say, hey, by the way, because you did X, we can tell, you know, we can put it on social media. So, uh, and again, not that we would, but again, a non-disclosure agreement is clearly what it is, our legal people. So, while I can't support all three of these, I do agree there's some merit, certainly in the timeline stuff, stuff and I would suggest that uh, I would be much more comfortable if staff could come back and say, the NDAs exist, and uh, but the first the first point I, I can't agree with so it's all or nothing so unfortunately I'm gonna have to go with uh, I would if this doesn't fly I will agree to refer it back to staff thank you Councillor Belanger yes uh, thank you uh, chair Bray uh, again I'm uh, looking for council to take a leadership position as we did with the indemnification policy that uh, we can we have an opportunity to set a benchmark that's beyond the norm of municipalities as we did prior and uh, I think there there's clearly a move and one of the moves to re eliminate NDAs is because it's buying silence and often it's very difficult uh, to prove one way or the other whether or not the individual is under duress uh, uh, when they sign an NDA often these uh, uh, the things are uh, are rare. Uh, uh, the complaintive is uh, not a legal expert. Uh, you know, hopefully, they get legal counsel. Uh, certainly, there's been a lot of uh, uh, in the press about uh, lawyers tend to uh, uh, sometimes look at monetary compensation as the major factor, as opposed to long-term mental health and those types of things. And, and as far as the uh, timeline, I think the timeline is reasonable. If we, if we just look at the news over the last three or four years, the number of things that have come forward after an extended period of time, and I'm not suggesting you know, 10 years is the right period of time, 
but three years would cover the vast majority of any term of council. Uh, so certainly, uh, you know, if, a, if an individual did have concerns about uh, putting in a complaint where there's potentially relationships that are established and friendships, that's their right. It's their right to, to fear coming forward. And I think what we need to do is we need to eliminate that fear. Like certainly a third party would very quickly contact our HR manager, but the fact is that that employee would know that the <coughs> only person that is re receiving their complaint that would hear anything about that complaint is an independent third party, and that is extremely important. Thank you. Councillor Kinney. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my big concern is the timeline. Um, my thought process with that is, and I've seen too many people in turmoil to say 10 days is enough. Um, mind you, I'm not a psychologist either. Um, but I'm in, I'm uncomfortable with the 10 days, three years. Uh, I don't know where an ending is. Um, I would be second guessing on that concept. Uh, third party, well, you've, you've um, answered that question for me that you've had the ability to reach out to a third party. Um, I do trust our HR person um, and know that she's a professional and will do what's right. Um, I've seconded the motion. I'll stay with seconding the motion, no problem. Um, but if another motion comes up with returning it back to staff, I'll, um, I'll support that one too. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kinney. Certainly the timeline uh, suggestion I, I could not support. The policy itself actually says that the whistleblower has a duty to report such misconduct as soon as learning of it to the lawful authorities. Three years is not as soon as you've learned about it. Um, and I think it also makes for very cloudy memories and reconstructive memories. And I don't know that um, extending it beyond you know, 30 days or 60 days or whatever HR determines to be reasonable, but I certainly don't support three years. Uh, but a quick question to our HR manager. It says other stakeholders. So this policy applies to you know, staff, uh, there's a whole list of people and then other stakeholders and I just wondered who that would include. Other stakeholders could essentially be anybody out in the public, it could be a resident, um, it could be a business owner, it could be, it's really a catch-all for anybody that feels they've come across some um, misconduct that they need to report. Okay, because it's listing um, employees, job applicants, volunteers, contractors, clients, students, and other stakeholders. During the discussion, I heard members of council. Now, we're also, like, we're held to the Municipal Act and our oath of office and, you know, the code of conduct. Would this also apply to, to members of council under the other stakeholders? Yes, it would. Yes, it would. So if, if observations were made for uh, staff that was um, any wrongdoing, they would have uh, the ability to report that. Okay, so then as a member of council, I would be interested to know how this would compare to the integrity commissioner project process, which already exists. Um, I, I would suggest that if, uh, if a councillor was seen as any wrongdoing, that would be reported to the integrity commissioner. But for staff, it would be reported through me. Uh, Mr. CAO? Yes, I think the uh, I think the managers indicated. So, if there was a complaint against a member of council, it would fall under the integrity commissioner process. What this refers to is who can who can file a complaint. So, and I think the manager said that a member of council could make a complaint about an employee uh, under this particular under this particular uh, policy, as could other stakeholders, et cetera, et cetera. It's making the complaint. Thank you very much. Uh, then seeing no more comments, we will read, well, I won't read the motion because I'm not 100% sure of the wording that Joe put in there, but I think we've all heard it twice. So the motion as amended. Um, Sorry, we're voting on the amendment. This is the amendment that includes third party timeline and NDA. So if, uh, the mover was Councillor Belanger, the seconder was Councillor Kinney, all in favor. Opposed? 
So then that motion fails, five to two. And we could go back to the original motion. Councillor Belanger, was there, there was yeah, a request in, in to my state, back to staff? In my, in my statement, I indicated that if this motion failed, that I would like a motion to refer it back to staff. Okay. So do you have a seconder to refer that back to staff? Councillor Foster? Okay. Uh, all in favor? Uh, sorry, so that, do I read the motion with a referring it back to staff? And I will. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. CAO. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to, just to be clear in terms of the, what staff are going to be referring to uh, when it goes back, uh, my understanding based on your, your earlier action and the comments that I heard is we're going to be dealing with the timeline, looking at a uh, timeline, whether it's appropriate to maintain a timeline or extend the timeline. That's what it's being referred back for. I just wanted to be clear so that staff are clear. That's certainly what I heard consistently across the board was concerns about the timeline. Okay, so uh, Councillor Belanger and Councillor Foster move and second that the General Government Services Section of Coordinated Committee recommend to Council that it refer the proposed whistleblower policy back to staff for revisions. Sorry, are you voting or are you commenting? Well, I, I wanted to comment on the CAO's remarks. I'm, I'm referring it back to staff to give consideration to all of the comments made here. They may come back and indicate that they're only going to make an adjustment to timeline, uh, but um, I want it referred back for everything that was discussed here today to be under consideration. Mayor Bifulci? Well, I think we just had a request to amend it to deal with those matters and there wasn't support. The only thing that I'm hearing support for is a discussion about timeline. So I would support referring it back to look at the timeline. If it is for all of those items, then I would have to vote against referring it back and ask that we go back to the main motion. If, if it just, sorry, uh, to the chair, if it's just going back for timelines, I withdraw my request for a referral. Okay, so if we're withdrawing the referral, that's okay with <coughs> Councillor Foster. Would you like to move the motion? I'll request that it be referred to the review timelines. Okay, and do we have a seconder to refer it back to staff or uh, Mayor Bifulci? Okay, so all uh, so that the General Government Services Section of Coordinated Committee recommend to Council that it refer the proposed whistleblower back to staff for a review of the timeline. All in favor? So that motion, uh, sorry, if I vote, that would be four. Uh, opposed? Councilor Moore, uh, four to three, that motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Okay, so moving to the next item on our agenda, 6.7 motions where notice has been previously given. 6.7.1, Councillor Kinney, RIA 40 kilometer per hour posted zone for park areas. Do you have a, do we have a mover in us? I guess I could read the motion and then um, look for a mover and a seconder. So, whereas the town of Wasaga Beach has 10 neighborhood play parks, those being Bateau Park, Blueberry Trail Park, Chase Family Park, Deer Trail Park, Glendale Community Park, Red Berry Park, Red Oak Park, Wasaga Estates Park, Wasaga Village Park, and William Arnill Memorial Park, all with youth playground equipment. Further, that Mills Park and Wasaga Sports Park also have youth playground equipment. And whereas elementary schools in the town have 40 kilometer posted zones where our youth are most vulnerable for their safety. And whereas the town established the above parks for the enjoyment of our youth and families during any time of the day. And further, that the safety afforded our youth during school hours should also be given to our youth and families all the time for their safety in the above parks. Therefore, be it resolved that staff draft a bylaw to make the roadways abutting the above parks 40 kilometers per hour posted zones for the appropriate distance on either side with required signage in the appropriate locations to notify vehicle traffic and increase the safety of our park users. Do we have a mover and a seconder for this motion? Councillor Kinney and Councillor Belanger. Uh, would you like to speak to this notice of motion, Councillor Kinney? Thank you, Madam Chair, and first off, I want to apologize to the Chair for the lengthy motion. 
I sit here and I read them myself, and yeah, no, that was a doozy. Um, but that being said, um, my overall thought process lies in the philosophy that <clears throat> if we as a municipality are looking to have our parks utilized and enjoyed by family members, um, my experience, and I think most people's experiences, um, moms, dads, little ones going to there uh, and enjoying them. And yes, the majority of, um, of the parks may be on, and they are in neighborhoods that have residential roads. Um, and some of them, people might think you can't speed. Well, I can tell you right now, you can speed anywhere, um, even on my little street, especially if you blow the stop signs. Um, but that being said, I truly feel that if we give another, another notice to our motoring public, not all will abide, because not all abide, but many will, and it could be that many will that will help a young person mature because they forgot they shouldn't run after a ball that crossed the road. So that's my, um, my thoughts on that, Madam Chair, and I do want to listen to um, the thoughts of council. Thank you. Thank you. Any, Mayor Bifulci. Thank you. I was just curious, um, there was an email um, from our Director of Public Works looking for clarification of these parks um, earlier. Um, I don't think everybody was copied on it. Did you get your answer so you're clear from a staff perspective what this is asking for? Uh, thank you, Mayor Boyfulci. Um There was an email correspondence, however, I had yet to have time to circle back with Councillor <laughs> Kinney. So, uh, but he did provide clarity with respect to the, the parks identified within the uh, within the notice of motion, so um, I'm comfortable with, with, uh, with his clarification. Councillor Wells. Uh, thank you, uh, Sylvia. <coughs> Just a, a couple of questions to Mark, and, and you know, I'm, I want to be clear, I, I'm all for anything that improves safety. Uh, that, let's be clear about that. Um, but I'm also very conscious of something I've said here numerous times in the past. Uh, don't make a rule that you cannot or will not enforce. And because if you do and you're not enforcing it, then you in fact diminish the respect for all the other rules that you have. Um, so I guess my question to Mark is, have you discussed this with the administration of our local OPP detachment in terms of their ability, resources, uh, and uh, capability to enforce uh, such a such an area uh, because if it's not being enforced it, it simply becomes redundant um, secondly uh, I'd, I'd be interested in what data there is that would uh, support the need to do this um, I guess a simple question would be how many speed related accidents have we had in the neighbor in the in the adjoining neighborhood of, of these ten parks. So what is the what is the supporting data that would that would justify making this particular amendment? And should the idea of improving the safety go forward, uh, I guess I'm kind of wondering whether the speed limit issue is the is the primary way to, to deal with it or whether community safety zones is a more appropriate way to do it. And I, I did do just a little bit of uh, cognizance, but uh, the, uh, just looking at the uh, f up to 15 over speed limit, there are no points involved, uh, but the fine is 5250 uh, if we went this route. The fine if we had a community safety zone is actually $95. It's almost double. Same thing, if you go 16 to 29 over, it's uh, three points. 
and the fines range from uh, 55 going up to 105 and 138 going up to 272. To me, I guess I'm not suggesting we should go that route. That, don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that that's the alternative route to go. But if the council determines they want to do something, then to me it makes more sense to provide a penalty that is a little more stringent and community safety zone would provide that um, as the alternative. But my primary question goes back, what is the data to support the need and what is the ability or the willingness or the availability of staff to enforce a rule uh, that, uh, that we make? And, uh, uh, so I can't support the motion at the moment without some of that other information, uh, specifically information coming back from the OPP administration. Thank you, Councillor Wells. Councillor Blanchet? Yes, thank you, Chair Bray. Uh, I kind of accept uh, Councillor Kenny's, uh, Kenny's rationale is that uh, whether it be a community safety zone or whether it be uh, a reduction in speed, I think there are a great number in our community do respect uh, those uh, signs and, and laws. And, and you, you, we can never stop someone that is irresponsible or reckless uh, from creating a tragedy. Uh, but certainly, uh, potentially, as uh, Councillor Kenny said, the, this could save lives. And, uh, you know, it's quite common in many other municipalities, I believe. I, I know traveling to and from uh, Waterloo, I go through a number of small towns that had uh, both uh, lower speed limits uh, in areas and community safety zones. So uh, I will support the, the motion either way. Thank you. Councillor Foster. Thank you. And, and uh, again, I think this is a case where it's, it's not difficult to err on the side of caution. I think, uh, again, as Councillor Belanger just pointed out, um, the signs, although not always followed, uh, or not followed all that often, at least create um, a willingness to lighten the foot on the accelerator. So, uh, you know, if you do see a zone that's 40, some people will comply perfectly, but other people may drop down to 45. And again, it just gives a chance. And the difference between an area with kids, as was pointed out by Councillor Kinney, is they don't necessarily have the experience with traffic uh, or quick decision making when their ball goes into the street. So anything that will give them a chance, I'm willing to err on the side of caution on that one. I'll support it. Thank you. And Councillor Watson. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I, I'll be supporting this, this also. I, I think the data uh, that stands out to me, um, it's not just in Wasaga Beach, it's every community, but all the slowdown signs that are popping up in residential neighborhoods, not necessarily just around our parks, but I'm seeing that on multiple streets in Wasaga, um, Collingwood, Midland, everywhere. And people are speeding, they're going too fast on, on lots of streets, and this is a start. And um, I'd be looking forward in the future to looking at traffic calming measures in, in some residential areas also. But this is a good start, and I will support it. Councillor Kinney. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, getting back to Councillor Wells' um, thought processes. Um, discussion with the OPP, no, I did not. Um, my overall thought process with regards to uh, don't make a rule that you can't enforce, it's a pretty solid one. My, my second thought on that is sometimes you have to make rules so that it will get enforced. Um, yes, I'm the first one to say that there's not a lot of resources at the OPP and they're spread thin. But my, my thought process wasn't just them. It was, as Councillor Foster said, the other motorists. My thought process is to get compliance, not a penalty. That's why I didn't go for community safety zone. Uh, signs will be a deterrent. 
And as far as data goes, um, one piece of data of a child being hit is too much. But I know from my previous motion a while ago with regards to 40 kilometer an hour zones, um, individuals are more likely to survive collisions at that than they are at 50. Um, and I'm hoping that translates to uh, our children too. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and certainly I understand the direction that uh, Councillor Kinney is proposing with respect to his motion. Um, just a couple of comments. With respect to his, uh, uh, the list of parks that have been proposed here, I'm not entirely sure whether all the parks are listed or not. Uh, certainly there's a, there's a good list here. So that would be the number one point. The other point I wanted to make was that not, not all parks abut a road. So some of them are more uh, interior parks where there may be a pathway that leads from the road uh, to the park and then another pathway that allows for the exit. So like Red Oak Park comes to mind that's on uh, just off Knox Road, uh, Knox Road West. Compare it to Mills Park where there is a road that right abuts uh, the park. So I under again, I understand where uh, Councillor Kinney is coming from, but perhaps, uh, Madam Chair, just a, a referral back to staff to uh, look at the list and if there's some criterion, if it's a local park abutting a road, um, you know, that type of thing, so that staff can look at that from a perspective still trying to meet council's objectives with respect to uh, providing a safe zone uh, around a, a local park. Thank you. Thank you very much. As one who lives very close to Red Oak Park, I've been driving around looking at the different parks, and certainly that one does have two 100-foot walk-ups through a forested path to get to the park, so you're less likely to have kids running onto the road. Um, so I would certainly be in support of a referral. I saw Councillor Wells before. Um, I will. Uh, Sylvia, so the uh, CAO stole my thunder already. Um, um, I guess uh, listen to the comments, uh, but I would respectfully ask that it now be referred back to staff um, for staff comment, but also specifically for uh, comment from the OPP. That, uh, that this uh, be uh, openly discussed with the OPP as to the, uh, the value and again the data and uh, the feasibility of, uh, of uh, having, it, uh, having it implemented. Um, we all know, um, and I guess uh, I have to be careful that Mark can probably confirm uh, that uh, you know, any speeding that is uh, 15 to, so let's say 15, I won't go to 20, but 15 over is pretty much not something that is enforced uh, on a general basis anyway because there's just too much other more critical things going on. So um, I guess I just question where the OPP would feel and fit into this, uh, into this model and I'd like any referral to have the staff engage the OPP administration in the discussion and provide comment from the report. Thank you, and for my comments, um, safe community is vital. That part I, I fully support. I question enforcement. Um, I liked Councillor uh, Councilor Wells' comments about a community safety zone because I thought they would set us up for uh, radar um, camera enforcement, which will ticket you at 10 over. Um, so as much as driving instructors will tell you you can do 10 over, the red light camera or the, uh, the speed camera will not. You will get the ticket in the mail. Um, so I would like to move a referral for this back to staff and as Councillor Wells summarized nicely for consideration of community safety zone versus just reducing the speed. Um, I'd like to see the cost of implementation. There were questions about enforcement and then OPP comments. Was there anything I missed in that referral back to staff? Councillor Kinney? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted one last comment. Go ahead. Um, I can definitely go with referred back to staff because, again, our staff knows what they're doing. 
Uh, to our CAO's comment about some of the the um, the parks that don't really abut roads, then why would we post a sign there? Um, that was my philosophy from the start. Um, look at where we need them. And my final thought process is my old employer. Um, yeah, definitely um, ask, but I don't want our decisions weighed on that. Because although the OPP may enforce it, and yeah, they're good partners, but I still feel the town is responsible for the overall safety of our town and the OPP is part of that. It's kind of like the philosophy that um, we are a town with a tourist industry. So we're responsible for safety, OPP helps us, um, but definitely, I'll, I don't have an issue because now it's still on the table and I appreciate that. So Councillor Kinney's happy with the referral. Councillor Belanger is a seconder. You would be happy? Okay, so then we're now voting to refer this back to staff to address the concerns that were discussed at the table. All in favor? And that motion passes 7 to 0, referring it back to our Director of Public Works. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda is item 6.7.2, Rearena Library Lands. This is a notice of motion from Councillor Belanger. Councillor Belanger would be the mover. Do we have a seconder for that motion? Seeing none, that motion does not make the table. Councillor Belanger? Uh, can I request that the motions are read? certainly up to the chair if she would like to read the motion but it is considered in the agenda is printed this is a public meeting so I request that they be read certainly certainly counselor I'm not trying to argue that they up to the chair so I can read the motion but it, to be clear at this point there is no seconder for the motion there will be no discussion unless somebody seconds it uh, where's the library arena lands were purchased more than two years ago and where as many members of the public have requested that the professional appraisal proceeding the town's purchase be made public including a freedom of information request and where's the decision to not release the details of the appraisal to the public was not a decision of council I motion that the arena library land appraisal be made public as soon as possible this was a notice of motion from Councillor Belanger is there anyone wishing to second this motion Seeing none, that motion is um, not being tabled. <laughs> okay, item 6.7.3, Councillor Belanger, redevelopment of Beach One, a public meeting. Do you have a seconder for this motion, Councillor Belanger? Sorry. So again, seeing none, that motion is scratched from the agenda. Item 6.7.4, Councillor Belanger, read the redevelopment of Beach One elements and venues. So we have, this will be moved by the notice of motion with Councillor Belanger and uh, seconder for item 6.7.4. Councillor Belanger? Yes, I, I would like all of the motions read publicly. If the chair decides that she does not want to, she's willing to do that, I understand but I'm requesting that they be read aloud. Thank you. I see no benefit in reading them at this point because there is no support at the table for them. I just want to also um, recognize that they are read into the record um, at our council meeting at their last meeting. So they are read publicly into the record and they are um, placed into our agenda in written form for council. There, there's no need to read them again, so it really is up to the chair, Councillor Belanger. Thank you. I'm not comfortable reading some of them because I don't think the statements in the motions are accurate, so I won't be reading the following two. Is there a seconder for 6.7.4? So again, seeing none, that motion is will not be tabled. So the next motion will be moving into closed session. 
Resolved that pursuant to section 239 a and I of the Municipal Act 2001 as amended, the next portion of the July 21st, 2022 coordinated committee meeting will move into closed session to discuss the security of the property of the municipality or local board and a trade secret or scientific technical, commercial, financial, or labor relations information. Supplied in confidence to the municipality or the local board, which if disclosed could reasonably be expected to prejudice significantly the competitive position or interfere significantly with the contractual or other negotiations of a person, group, of persons, or organization. If I could have a mover, please. Councillor Blanger and a seconder. Go ahead, Councillor Blanger. Thank you. Prior to going into closed session, I will state that I do not agree that item number two, section one, subject starting with Baylock Development Inc. should not be an in-camera item and will be forwarding it to the Obmanson closed meeting investigator for a ruling. I do agree that section two, subject starting with update number 10, Baylock Development Inc. is an appropriate in-camera item. Thank you. I'm sorry, Councillor Belanger, the items you're referring to, um, I think you were releasing more information than, than that is on our agenda. I don't see an item two, I see an 8.1, 8.2, 8.3. No, no, there's two in, our, in, our in the in-camera documents you're referring to. And I don't think that it's appropriate to be referring to documents in our in-camera package in public. Madam Clerk, are we comfortable with this? I'm. Um, I I can't make any determination on whether Councillor Belanger is uh, saying things that are inappropriate as far as uh, whether our closed session or, or is releasing information that shouldn't be. Um, but I will say that um, the town did consult our solicitor and um, is very comfortable with the items that we are putting into closed session um, that are uh, fall within the act, fall within the exemptions of the act, and that was explained. So I'm comfortable with going into closed session with the information that we are um, providing in closed session. Thank you very much. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Mayor Bifolci, Councillor Wells, all in favor to move into closed session? And that motion passes.
Deputy Mayor, we should be live now. Okay, welcome back. Uh, this is uh, the General Government Services section of Coordinated Committee reconvening after closed session. I just wanted to start uh, by saying that there were some comments made by Councillor Belanger questioning the appropriateness of one of the items on our in-camera agenda and those were addressed by our lawyer Marianne Bench when we were in camera to confirm that we were in compliance. Coming out, the first motion is that Council receive the report from the Director of Recreation, Events and Facilities provided in closed session pertaining to financial contractual matters for information. If I could get a mover and a seconder please. Councillor Kinney, Mayor Bifulci, all in favour? Opposed if any? And that motion ca carries six to one with Councillor Belanger in opposition. Item 8.2, the CAO's report read the update on the beachfront property. That Council received the verbal update report from the CAO provided in closed session pertaining to beachfront negotiations for information. If I could get a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Foster, Councillor Wells, all in Madam, favor. Madam Chair, just if I may, I, d I didn't see that motion I think that um, it's more than just for information I think it's also for direction oh so. did I skip the second half I did Sorry. I apologize so I will reread it and then you can decide if you still want a first and second so the council received the verbal update report from the CAO provided in closed session pertaining to beachfront negotiations for information and further that council confirmed the direction provided to the CAO in closed session pertaining to beachfront negotiations better Councillor Foster, you're still, and Councillor Wells. All in favor? Opposed, if any? And that motion carries six to one with Councillor Belanger in opposition. Motion 8.3, the CAO's verbal update, re-municipal property negotiations. That council received the report from the CAO provided in closed session pertaining to municipal property negotiations for information and that council confirmed the direction provided to the CAO in closed session. A mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Kinney, Councillor Wells. Sorry to interrupt there, uh, Madam Chair. So that one, it, uh, there was no direction. It was just for information. So that one, the, the direction part could be dropped. Okay. So should I reread it or can we just drop the uh, second part of the motion? Okay. Uh, so that was Councillor Kinney, Councillor Wells, all in favor? And that motion carries seven to zero. And then item 8.4. Uh, that Committee of the Whole received the external board meeting minutes of April 28, 2022, provided in closed session for information. A mover, Councillor Watson, Councillor Kinney, and... Uh, we are... I was just reading, sorry. <laughs> By this point in the day, my tummy's growling. <laughs> uh, okay, so the motion by Councillor Kinney and Councillor Watson that coordinated committee received the external board meeting minutes of April 28th, 2022, provided in closed session for information. All in favor? And that motion carries seven to zero. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.